right. This is Project Herpetoculture Podcast, episode 55. I'm your host, Roy Arthur Blodgett, joined as always by the dashing and charismatic Philip Leitz over there. And we have an amazing guest that I'm excited to talk to today. But before we introduce him, we're going to go through our standard housekeeping. And first, I want to give a shout out to Charlie, who edits our audio. And um, it's just generally a wizard and legend around these parts. I also want to give a shout out to Dylan and the Animals at Home Network for hosting our show. The GOAT. And I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. So we have Custom Reptile Habitats. They are makers of premium PVC reptile enclosures. And they also have a whole product line with universal rocks and all kinds of stuff like that. So if you're in the market for anything like that, please um, go ahead and use the link in our bio and description to make your purchase and we'll receive a small commission at no additional cost to you. That helps keep the lights on over here. Um, we also have cold-blooded caffeine and their roasters of premium coffee from all over the world. We have a uh, private label with them, which is a light roast coffee from R- Rwanda. That's really delicious, but they have a whole bunch of other coffees from all over the place for broad, different palate. And um, yeah, if you make a purchase through them, you can use the discount code, uh, Project Herp for 10% off. And lastly, I want to give a shout out to Fairy Tale Dragons. That's Heather Moy and Ron St. Pierre, two absolute legends in the field of herpetoculture. And we're really honored that they have elected to sponsor the show and support what we're doing here. So if you're in the market for beater dragons or interesting um, giant anoles, anything like that, have a look at what they've got. They just posted a bunch of stuff up um, that they were planning to bring to Tinley. So check them out. And yeah, if you're interested in supporting the show directly, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash project herpetoculture. And we always welcome subscribers there. Um, And any feedback really from our listeners is always welcome. So yeah, with all that out of the way, I'm going to pass it to Phil to introduce our guests and jump in with the first question. Yeah, yeah. So um, this our guest today is Dan from Amphibicast. Dan, thank you so much. Is that how I how do I pronounce your last name? Sorry. You mean like my show name or my like real oh, last name? Well, whichever you uh I guess I just, I just I, yeah, I just I just go by Dan Drobades because it's kind of a bad play on words and it's actually easier to pronounce my real last name. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. It's I think it's a great play on words, by the way. I was genuinely um, just downstairs having a, a brief meeting with uh, with with my boss, and he was asking me what I have going on for the rest of the day. And I'm like, oh, I'm meeting. I'm going to do a podcast with this guy who's his his name is Dan Drobades, but it's like it's it's not his real name, but it's this play on Dan. <laughs> and I was explaining it to him, and he was just like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> um, but I so I know we're going to get into a lot about uh, like yourself and your, your sort of your history and your background, but before we hit record, we were, t- we were having a conversation and, and you were mentioning about when you do things like podcasts and, and, and videos sort of like outwardly facing content, sort of be yourself. And I wanted to, I really thought that would just be gr- a great jumping off point. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit on what you meant by that and kind of what you were getting at, I think this would be a cool place to start. Sure. Thanks. And uh, and again, before we get into it, I just want to thank the both of you for taking, you know, letting me come on. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I've listened to your guys shows and um, you guys have a nice chemistry. You you put out a great podcast. So just thank you, you know, for me right off the bat. Thank you. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, when I started creating content, I was like, I'm, I'm really like critical of myself. I'm the, you know, kind of a, a perfectionist like I'm, I'm really retentive about stuff things bother me really easily and when i started doing this off uh, you know right off the bat i wanted to make sure that what i did was quality enough that people were going to be interested in it and after the first kind of couple of hiccups and whatnot or the first couple of maybe months or years or whatever i was able to kind of get a handle on it and the more i got a handle on it the more i realized it's just be yourself, you know, don't try to create a fake persona for yourself, be who you are and the audience will follow you. And I feel like anyone who creates content, that's an integral part of it. If you want to inspire someone to love the things that you love and you want to inspire someone to do the kind of work that you do, be yourself and be your best self. And I feel like that just translates really into anything you do, you know, professionally. I mean, obviously we're all many things, you know, I mean, I, I keep frogs, but there's all sorts of other things I do. Bring all those things into your persona. And you know, when you make 
content, you want people to not just appreciate the content, but you want them to appreciate the person who's giving that content. So that's kind of what I meant about just, just be yourself, you know, put your heart into it, be yourself. And, you know, people, people are into it. They'll go along with it. And I've been very fortunate in that regard. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So yeah, that's a that, that's a really super interesting pr- perspective, and I feel like it it kind of echoes what I've heard. You know, I, I remember a long time ago. I, I can't remember exactly where I heard this. It might have been a TED talk. It might have been, you know, at this point, sometimes the content all kind of blurs together unless it's like this, you know, really vivid, you know, memory of this thing. But um, I heard someone who was giving a presentation and using the sort of the little the shorthand of people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And I, I, you know, I feel like that sort of relates here somehow, you know, and, and it's like, uh, I think he was sort of talking about how he was like, well, let's talk about the difference between say like, you know, Macintosh and, and other, you know, like in windows and, and, and any kind of PC stuff. It's like, there's not necessarily anything inherently more good or valuable or special about Macintosh computers. And yet, they've sort of like captured the, the, like the public identity in some way. Right. And it's like, his argument was it's because there's something more compelling about Mac and why they do what they do and how they present what they're doing to you. And it's about, you're almost like purchasing your own individuality in some ways. That's what, that's what they kind of make you feel like, even though you're buying the same phone that everyone and their monkey has. Right. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, in that case, it's maybe a bit of a contradiction, but, um, I do think you're 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 really onto something there in the sense that like uh people people really do seem to resonate with individuals and and like why you're doing the thing that you're doing. It's not necessarily about the thing itself. I mean, you know, uh even in even in something like obscure like mountain climbing, it's like, oh, why, you know, like I'm not necessarily interested in the fact that somebody climbed Mount Everest even though it is profoundly interesting thank you john Krakauer. but like it, it is super interesting but like why one would want to climb mount everest is is like a little bit more interesting to me than the actual act of climbing it, it itself or or for another example would be um like alex honnold and, and free in the movie free solo right which he's he's been a rock cl- like a famous rock climber for forever but he you know he did this most recent thing and and Jimmy Chin the the documentarian filmmaker kind of f- documented his his progress in, in climbing uh you know free soloing this massive climb in Yosemite and it's like it like sure at the end of the day the sort of like the climax of the whole thing is him climbing this thing with no rope and it's just like what but at the same time there's this why are you doing this? Like why I'm so much more interested in like, why the hell are you doing this? And like, what, what is driving you to do this in the first place? And so I guess I'm curious, like, why do you do what you do? Like what? How, so, I mean, this, this could be, uh, maybe this is a great kind of segue into saying a mixture of questions for you. So I, I hope it doesn't get too, too much. I'm not trying to jumble too many things together, but say, let's say if we can compartmentalize this and say, what's your sort of herpetocultural origin story and then how did it mature and professionalize for you into the life that you're living now? And then sort of in a tertiary sense, how did the, like the, the, you know, the podcast and everything and all the other things that you do, how do they all kind of crystallize and come to be? How, and what drove you to do it in the first place? Yes. Everything coalesced. So, um, oof. All right. So I, I guess if you wanted to start at the beginning, we'd go back to just being a young kid yeah. I was always fascinated with things that repulsed other people. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I was always interested in, uh, especially reptiles, especially. And um, there was some small mom and pop reptile stores in the neighborhood I grew up in. And I was just hooked. I would go in there, you know, my mom would take us go grocery shopping, whenever we would go in the pet stores and hang out. And um, some of the earliest Animals that I kept were amphibians because my mother was kind of freaked out by reptiles, but um, things like axolotls, um, xenopus, uh, or actually it wasn't it wasn't xenopus, it was the other species that's um, similar clawed frog. Like it's, it's eluding me at the moment, but um, that we had access to all sorts of crazy species of salamander and newt back then. This is long before any of the 
uh, Lacey Act amendments and whatnot. So it was pretty much a free for all. It was very, very eclectic palette of what you could keep. And I tried to keep as many different things as possible. And it was just, it, it just seemed like a natural thing to me. I was always inspired by nature. I was inspired by things that were outside around me, which is kind of ironic because I really didn't like being outside when I was a kid. But yeah. I, was, I, I, I love nature documentaries and they were very, it was very different from the way it is today. It was a lot more of just cinematography where you honestly very seldom even had pre presenters, you usually had a narrator. George Page was one that was really inspirational to me. He hosted nature in the 1980s. And of course, uh, you know, David Attenborough is, oh, yeah. goes without saying uh, at one point that John Forsyth hosted a nature show. That's, that's really a long time ago, but I, I liked to, to watch natural drama un unfold. I like to watch living things do what they did, good, bad, the ugly. And to me, it was kind of a way of, I guess you could say kind of like, you know, stepping outside of myself. There's things I was comfortable with, you know, as, as a kid, you have things that you struggle with, you have anxieties, you have fears, you have challenges and whatnot. And this just kind of was always just a home base for me. And as I got older, when I got into high school, I actually had my first reptile room in my semi walk-in closet. So I had a whole, I had a whole bunch of tanks in there. I had everything. I had Savannah monitors. I had a Colombian tegu. I had different species of gecko. Uh, I kind of got away from the frogs for a while around that time, but um, I had that, and um, I had my my golden gecko, which passed away a few years ago. I think I had him for like fifteen years. Wow! Wild, wild caught pet store golden gecko, and uh, I kept him. Um, uh, I guess whatever we'll, we'll get to that later, but like naturalistic, I, 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 I wish I had it around to show you guys a, a photograph from 1995, the, the tank that I had this thing in, I was pretty proud of at the time, yeah. but, um, yeah, so that went on and as time went by going on to, into the two thousands, I met my wife around the year 2002 and I just started, started going to expos and, you know, move new location. My wife and I began to live together and my collection kind of came along with me at the time I brought, uh, I, I honestly had like, I had like nothing. I had my car and I had two white street frogs and a golden gecko. And, um, you know, we started our life together and the animals kind of just came along with it and different times it peaked, you know, I had kids and whatnot. And at the time the collection kind of dwindled a little bit and, um, right around 2016, I decided that it was um, time to make some changes in my life. There was a lot of things that I wasn't happy with and I wanted to live a healthier life and just um, correct those things that I wasn't happy with. And the animals were always a home base. It was always a safe place. And that's what I gravitated towards too. So around 2016, I, I got into it with a much more focused attitude. I started with the, the poison frogs and I kind of set that as a goal for myself saying, you know what, I kind of want to dedicate my efforts towards one thing and the poison frogs just, just were a perfect match. Mm. And, um, I mean, I could probably go on for hours, but that's kind of the gist of, of how I ended up from a kid to where I am now and, you know, surrounded by animals and it just seems right. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, did you, was your, was your wife like kind of, was she psyched or indifferent or, uh, you know, uninterested in the, in the herb tiles? It, it was an interesting thing. Um, we went to some of, went to some of the first expos together and we have, my wife is very into photography. So she was always eager to photograph the animals. And even today she enters, she's won a few, quite a few competitions. Actually, she was published in photographer's forum for a photograph of a, believe it or not, a wet mount of a, of a cane toad. I had a cane toad in 1997 that died and I wet mounted, I like, you know, wet preserved it in alcohol in a jar. And she took a photograph of the toad in the jar and she, she won um, a spot in photographer's form with that photo. So for her, wow. the, she, you know, she's not into like the day-to-day -day stuff. You know, not everybody is, but the photographic aspect of it interests her taking pictures of the frogs and whatnot. And it's, you know, animals don't always cooperate, but I'm actually using mm. some of her photo equipment to record this. So it's, it's mm. interesting dynamic, you know, a, a lot of credit to her for being patient and really encouraging and being supportive of this. It's something that's not necessarily within everyone's comfort zone. And it's become just such a part of our lives that we really couldn't imagine life any other way. We've had dogs, we've had, mm. Guinea pigs. We've had everything. My 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 young my uh, my oldest daughter. She's uh, she she keeps mammals, and um, it's just it's just a part of our lives. It's kind of just become this thing that is just you know normal to have you know, 30, 40 frogs in the basement and yeah. 
So do you, do you get the, do you get the same? So back when I had everything in, 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 in like my home, um, I would get people who would come over and just would like want to come over to take like a tour. They would just be like, I'm just, you know, like friends, just like family friends. Who, come on, let me go. Let me go check out. Come on. Can we go see the lizards? And I'm always like, yeah, yeah, we can go see the lizards. Ah, come on, let's go do it. You know? And, and then now it's like, now that it's in a separate space, now I'm, I'm finding myself like a lot more protective of it and a lot more. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm not going to let people come over and mm-hmm. sorry. It's like, I let friends, you know, like, um, coworkers and, and I'll let, especially it, almost always it's when coworkers have kids. I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's have, bring your family. Mm-hmm. Over. Come on, you can bring them. Like I'll give them a tour, you know, cause I'm always happy to help, uh, you know, sort of edu- educate the youth as it were, yeah. uh, you know, it's kind of the thing I, uh, and it's not, even though it's like a small thing, it, it's, it feels nice to do that. And, um, mm-hmm. and it, it, I know what you mean. There's like this weird, it's like a, um, I can't, I, I can't imagine not doing it now. It's like, it, it, it feels so tightly intertwined with, with, my experience of the world and the way I like to live and the kind of the way I like to spend my time that I, I really struggle to envision a, a, a way of life, excuse me, without it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and so uh, another thing would be, so when did, when did, I guess, was there, was there a moment when it professionalized more in a way for you? And then like, what drove you to start the the podcast as well? Well, I mean, again, if we go around to 2015, 2016, is kind of the, the crucial turning point here. I, uh, I mean, again, I made a lot of lifestyle changes. And, you know, unfortunately, you, you reach times in your life where you, you look at what's going on, what you're doing to yourself, and you realize that something has to change. And obviously, investing a lot of time in the animals was, for me, a good thing. It was a good therapeutic thing. It, it helped me through a, a very difficult time and it continues to help me. And the podcasting kind of came around the same time. I had a very, very hard time sleeping at night. And I started listening to podcasts. And honestly, it had little to nothing to do with with animals. I was actually into a lot of paranormal stuff and like cryptid stuff. And I would listen to that on YouTube. And then I found out that um, there were podcast players like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, which were really the only two at the time. Now there's more. And I started just really, really having this, I developed this appetite for podcasts. And the more I listened, the more I thought to myself, I, I got to do this one day, I do this. And then we'll fast forward to around 2020. Uh, I, had, I had changed careers around 2019, which allowed me to have more time. And then come 2020, uh, a lot of, it was a hard time for everybody and 2020 was a very very stressful difficult and you know frightening time for a lot of people for a lot of reasons and i mm-hmm. wanted to do something that was going to be the opposite of that i got tired of all the chaos and fear and all this all this other stuff that was going on i wanted to create something that was fun and pleasant and constructive and i also i said to myself you know what you're, you got sent home from work for a while and you, I want to have something constructive to show for my time. I don't want to just say three years from now that I just sat on my ass and didn't do a thing. So yeah. started a podcast and um, did it week after week after week. And it just kind of became a thing. Again, like I said before, I'm, I'm kind of retentive and, and I, I just, I latch on to something I don't let go. And it was a positive thing. It was something that was good. It took my time off. It took time and focus away from negative things. And it just became something for me. And as, as it developed, I started to make new contacts with people and started listening to other podcasts in, in a similar vein. Um, got a lot of inspiration from, from, from Dylan, of course. Dylan's podcast was very, very inspirational. And Bill Strand, the Chameleon Academy, mm-hmm. those two were really... Those are really the two animal podcasts that gave me a basis to, to, to work with. I've said, all right, you know what? I like what these two are doing. I don't, obviously I'm not going to copy them. I want to do it my own way, but I kind of want to stay in that vein. And mm-hmm. now I just, I just finished recording episode 152. Wow. The fourth, the fourth year of the podcast and congratulations. That's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's fun. It's cool. That's really cool, man. It, it's, um, I totally relate to what you're saying with the, 
I have like a same kind of thing. I have like this craving for podcast content, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's like, I I listen to all kinds of weird podcasts, everything from sort of like science-based podcasts. I've listened to like true crime podcasts. I've been listening to, um, I, there's one I I follow called spooked, which is just like a scary Mm -hmm. podcast. It's it's like, kind of creepy, um, you know, and and I love that stuff. Oh, it's awesome. And, and I, and I think, I think it kind of fi- it feels like um uh what's the word uh it it feels like someone's telling me a story like reading me a story you know which Roy and I were talking about yesterday or I think it's day before yesterday or day before um about yeah. how you know there's probably something really really like primal in us that responds to being told a story you know and so it's like this really fulfilling and and engaging thing to um to listen to. And, and so it's, it's cool that you were, you were kind of inspired through all of that to just, did you, I think, yeah, yeah go ahead, Roy. Sorry. I'm going like, to, I was going to say, um, I was going to say that also, I mean, I think that connects to, to what, what you were saying, Dan, around just like authenticity and like what, how it's important to like, um, for listeners to be able to connect with the host, you know? And like, for me, I think a lot of that has to do with just storytelling, you know, it's like, or like what, you know, Phil was talking about with Apple versus Mac or whatever. It's like, it's all just, that's, that's what branding is, right? Branding is just, it's just storytelling. And I think that that that's also part of why it's like such a, it remains such a compelling thing, you know, it's just that, uh, you know, for the vast majority of our, you know, time as a species, you know, storytelling was one of the ways in which we made sense of the world around us, you know, as part of our cosmologies and just like how we metabolize, um, our experience, I think is a lot of times has been through story and it just, it's something that I relate to too, in terms of just podcasts and just feeling kind of like an insatiable, (laughs) um, appetite for them and everything. It also makes me curious, like if there are podcasts outside of like the, you know, animal space that, that, that felt like inspirations to you as you set out. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you really hit it on the head with regards to storytelling. Like I, I'm, I'm a big reader, and I my mm-hmm. my formal education was actually in, in English. I majored in English, and it basically translated into absolutely no practical skill whatsoever. But uh, you know, I learned a lot. I learned about a lot about storytelling, and then just you know, professionally, just what what I did for a good 15 years was like I, I work in, in sewer and drain business. And a lot of wild stuff happen and you hear a lot of meet people from all different walks of life. And it's a lot of interesting stories. And I, I enjoy hearing what other people have to say. And if you can come on the show and it's interesting and we can talk about something that's going to get people thinking, like if, if you like it, if you don't like it, as long as it's get you think that's, that's what I think, you know, a good story, mm-hmm. you know, telling does, but, um, yeah, I, I do. I prefer the I prefer interview style podcasts. I, I'm a little late to the game, but I, I started listening to Joe Rogan within the past maybe like six months or so. Wow, I'm, yeah. I just like I'm like I want to see what he what what is he doing? How does he interview people? And I, I like his style. I, I know he's really popular. I know he's people have different feelings about him. I you know I don't, I really don't care. I just I think that uh, you know as an interviewer and as a personality, he's you know he's himself. And mm-hmm. at the end of the day. He's he's good at get, he's good at getting people to tell stories to share things and then like it's that's you know it's enjoyable but yeah you're right you know you go back ten thousand years what were we doing we were sitting around a fire and we were talking to each other in fact it's, I was reading a piece mm-hmm. of research a while back that basically some the extent that like fire cooking food over a fire was instrumental in human speech because it gave us the time. Yeah. And the and the the biological need to have something to do to communicate, which I thought was pretty cool. But yeah, other podcasts I listen to. I, I listen to some paranormal stuff. I, I listen to Sasquatch Chronicles. I listen to Into the Fray, uh, Confessionals with Tony Merkel. Uh, Tony Merkel actually had a really. Uh, I think his father does it. It's called um. Oh, I can't remember what it was, but it was about like um like trucking like trucking stories. Cool. Like guys who do like long haul trucking and, and some of those stories are just were just wild. I actually I, I I I did go on his show once, Hammer Lane Legends. I said I went on his show once like a couple mm. weeks ago just talking about some of the antics that I experienced in the sewer business. But you know, it's yeah. just, 
I like interesting characters. I like interesting people. I like hearing people's stories because that's what makes us all mm-hmm. human. Everyone's got a story. And if it's interesting and you can articulate it, you know, I, I think that that's entertaining. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree with that. It's, it's, um, there's something about uh, hearing someone's story. And especially when it comes from the angle of like, here's what I've experienced. Here's been like my, kind of track rather than here's what I did, you know, like that. that I feel like that's a, a pretty important distinction because when you hear someone's story as in like, this was like my life growing up and here's how, you know, that's how this, then this happened. And then I moved to Berlin and then I did whatever. And then I went to Seattle and then I, well, and then there was some stuff and people and like relationships. And then, you know, I started this thing and I'm here. It's, I find it really really difficult to like dislike someone or, you know, feel a lot of vitriol towards them after I've heard that about who, whoever it is, you know, it, it gets, it gets, a, I, I feel like it gets a lot harder to, uh, you know, to like, to, because that, you know, that closes the, the gap between you and that person, you know, there's that yeah. all of a sudden there's that profound sense of relatability. We're like, well, I've been on a truck, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even though I've never been a trucker, I can be like, well, I, you know, I've been in one and I kind of understand a little bit, you know, so, you know, all of a sudden you can kind of like plant yourself mm-hmm. there. And, and I think that, I think there's something about that in what's so fun about doing shows like this. And, and I'm sure about similar with yours. It's like, you know, when we have someone on who's like, well, I went to Panama and I, and I hung out with crocodiles for like seven months and I got to like pull an egg out of the ground and like hear the little thing go. Nah, and like, and then I went across and saw some monkeys. You're like, Whoa, like I've, I want to do that. You know, it's, it's a really mm-hmm. kind of a beautiful thing. So I guess like when you started your, your, your show, did you, did you tell anybody you were going to do it or did you like set everything up? put it all together and then like make a recording and then just like put it out in the world and say like, I have a thing now. How did that go? Um, I kind of just, <laughs> kind of just pulled it out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a discussion with my wife and we were talking about the idea and I said, you know what? I said, I want to, I said, I want to do this. And you know, she's very supportive. She's, you know, you know go ahead. And I kind of planned out what I wanted to do. Like the, the inception was like, I, I didn't want to go into this unprepared. I kind of came up with the idea of what I wanted to do. And I just sort of like kind of cold called people. Like I had, I remember my, my first guests where I, I did a, I did a solo episode as an introduction and I did a, um, um, oh, there goes a the dog. Uh, I did an interview with with a colleague about axolotls. She was very gracious to come on and do that. And Travis Stutchman from uh, TCS Dog Frogs. I just emailed him out of nowhere, and he came on the show. And uh, Mark Mandika from the Amphibian Foundation. I I just I think he was like episode like five or six or something like that, and he came on. And this I just remember them being the first people that just sort of, you know, no questions asked, came on. And I did the interviews. And as time went on, I got more people who were interested in more people who heard of the podcast. Cause like at first trying to get scientists on and researchers was like, it was not, it was not happening. And as time went by and I had more people on and more people on, it generally just became like, no one said no anymore after like about a year, year and a half. So I, I started, like I said, I started recording. I released, I released like through like three episodes in the summer of 2020 and um, I, it just kind of went from there and it just kind of became a routine thing. I saw I dedicated Tuesday evenings to it. And then um, now I usually do Wednesday or Thursday nights and um, I've just kind of kept at it. And I really don't know how it worked. I kind of used Instagram as the main platform to launch it. I started following people. I got some people that followed me in return. I mean, right now I've got like, like 1800 followers on Instagram, which really isn't much in the grand scheme of things, but you know what? It, it's it helps it's it helps network. It helps promote the show with this type of like long form content. You know, you're not getting clicks and likes the way you are with like reels or I mean, I don't TikTok. I don't even go near TikTok, but you're not yes. getting that type of, <laughs> of, of like I guess you call it like soft engagement. Like people who like like things and they leave a comment, mm-hmm. but then they kind of forget about it and they move on. Whereas with like mm-hmm. this is kind of like long form content. 
you're not going to get the, the massive audience that you're going to get with a YouTube short or something like that, but you're going to get better retention and you're going to have more of an intimate relationship with a smaller audience, which is, I'm, I'm cool with that. And the audience grew and the episodes, the downloads got, you know, went from just being like 10 or 15 to getting you know, much, much higher. And um, I just kind of kept at it. And now I'm kind of, kind of, I guess, where I, where I, where I wanted to be. And uh, it's cool. Mm-hmm. It's helped me, it's helped me network with other content creators, other podcasts. It's given me the opportunity to make friends with people that I looked up to before I started this. And, um, you know, I, I, I had a plan, but I didn't have the plan. And I kind of reevaluated everything as I went along. And I realized, all right, I'm doing something right here because people are responding to it. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish I had a better, more interesting story, but I kind of just, I kind of just did it as I went along. No, I mean, I think, but that's the, that's the point is I, I think that's a profoundly interesting story. You know, I, I'm not, uh, there are people out there who have started and maybe I don't really know any of them that are like reptile or amphibian people. This is mainly, I'm thinking more about celebrities, right. Who have decided like, no, I'm going to make a podcast. And then they like, they plan it all out. They record and put in the can, like their first 10 episodes. They set up sponsors before they even air. They decide to make, go and make the rounds on all the most famous podcasts in advance. So that way they can garner listenership right away. They're almost like, set up for success in some regard, you know, but, it, but it's like some of the, some of the most interesting podcasts and things that I've ever stumbled upon and listened to have all been ones that are so organic and are much more like, mm. uh, like you find them or someone tells you about them or you hear an excerpt of one of them or something. And you're like, what, this is a crazy show or this is so interesting. And it ropes you in. And and like what you're saying, maybe you don't get the huge numbers you know, sort of like the more superficial like based I'm playing into the algorithm, which like, I think the, I, I make, you know, I don't want to assume anything about you, Dan, but I think mm-hmm. the three of us, we seem to be the kind of people. And from what you just told me, we're the kind of people who might be like diametrically opposed to that kind of engagement. Yeah. <laughs> and I am, I know I am for sure. Like it, it even mm-hmm. irks me. It even irks me when like a page that just has like 500,000 followers on Instagram shares one of my pictures and tags me in it. I'm like, nope, this is not what I want. This is not what yeah, I'm here I don't, for. I don't like that either. No, I don't like it at all. It's like, cause that's not what I'm here for. That's not what I'm interested in, you know? And you're right. There's something about the, the more immediate or not even immediate, uh, the more in-depth kind of engagement, the kind of person who's going to subscribe and they're going to follow you and they're going to listen to almost every episode you do because they care about what you're up to. You know, I mean, that's a, and, and, and I, I mean, you can get a little bit of a bias in some way. It's like we, so this would be something I'm curious to ask you about because for us, we've, we've had this experience of like getting a lot of positive feedback from people where, you know, people mm-hmm. will message us and say, Oh, we, we love what you're doing. And it's like, that's great. And I'm waiting for the first person to comment on one of our YouTube videos or something and be like, you guys are fucking idiots and you're terrible and I'm going to kill you. You know, like I'm waiting for that because then, I, but the thing is, I like, I don't really read the comments. So I'm not, you know, and I, I, I'm just not really interested in it, but um, I, yeah. I've been fortunate that I haven't had really much in the way of negativity. I, I attribute that to a few things. Number one, I think that when you do this type of thing, it's important to be humble about it. Yeah. And I mean, I don't get me wrong. I take a lot of pride in what I do and I, I, I take what I do very seriously and I, I like to be professional about it. But at the same time, I, I try to be respectful of, of all my guests. I try to make sure everyone's comfortable on the show. I try to keep control. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I get guests and get a little bit, a little bit animated so you kind of have to, you know, keep control. And sometimes I get guests that are just like, they, I do most of the talking because it's hard to get sometimes everyone's different. You know, sometimes you have to really prompt people to, um, to, to get moving. But yeah. um, I think just, you know, just, just being yourself, being a humble person, some people aren't going to like it. You know, I, I had some, I had some criticism very early when I went, like early when I went on and like this, this person kind of, you know, went out of his way to just be, just like like nasty to the point where it was like 
you just what are you like you you you're I'm trying not I'm trying not to curse but yeah no uh, curse uh, but like like what the fuck is wrong with you you know yeah, like, yeah. like, like, mm-hmm. like you you take issue with something that I just started that much that you're going to go on this crusade to try and ruin me before I've started yeah and uh. I just I was like, all right, you know what? And and like I engage this person. I said, all right, fine. You know what? I said, I'm sorry. You don't like the content. That's fine. But I'm not holding, you know, I'm not holding you down for us. You need to listen to it. Right. And then that 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 dissipated years ago. But you know what? I, I use that as I said to myself, you know what? Don't be like this person. You know, don't mm-hmm. go out of your way to, to try and knock people down. You know, just, just be professional. Try not to be overly critical. I'm like, there's stuff I'm critical of. There's stuff that I don't like. And there's stuff that I've, I've, I've voiced to people that I just don't like. But at the same time, if you're creating a show and it's not bothering me, how does that affect? You? It doesn't. It's not interfering with me. Yeah. So that was, mm-hmm. that was an issue off the bat. And I've seen some other, like, I mean, I'm really, I'm really private. Like, I just, the show is, doesn't have a, a YouTube presence much. The only time I'm on YouTube is when mm-hmm. I do other collabs. But I, I've seen some like weird comments and stuff like that. But I just try not to engage it because I feel like once you engage someone like that, you're giving that person the fuel and then you're drawing more attention to that comments. Like sometimes like when you see something mm-hmm. that's really bad, just walk away. You know, yeah. the best thing you can do is like, you know, I mean, like, you know, Phil, you're into jujitsu, right? You, you know, oh, yeah. if you're, you know, you're in the ring, it's professional. It's, it's one thing. But like when you're out on the street, sometimes the best thing you do is just walk away. The, the best fight to, to win is the one that mm-hmm. you don't get involved with at all. Yeah. So I, yeah. I try to I try not to engage people who have a lot of negative stuff because they're just going to sink themselves anyway. You know, let, let this yeah. person mm-hmm. look like a fool. Let, let him make himself look like a fool without me having to add anything to it. And that's how I that's how mm-hmm. I deal. With that. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, there's so much there. It, it um the it's it's actually really funny it's uh, man I, I feel like this is so poignant right now uh right now you know there there was a, a long time ago uh i was involved with collared lizards and there was a situation in which I, I, there was a, a person who was like a contemporary of mine who um you know i i not trying to smear anybody so i'm not really going to get into the details but basically this person had photoshopped a, a photograph like a wild photograph of an animal and photographed it or uh, photoshopped it into a terrarium and said, Oh, I like, I was the first in the person, first person in the world to breed this thing. And I, and I, and I remember, well, th- it's, it's, I think this is really interesting. This is like a fast, uh, this, I think this will tie back when you, when I get to like the big reveal here, <laughs> which is I, I posted up the original photograph and then the one he photoshopped. And I said, Hey, here's this guy who, you know, like, I'm not, you know, be careful of who you deal with. Right. And I credited the original photographer and I'm like, just so you know, this guy's like stealing your work and doing what you do, you know, and all this Mm -hmm. stuff. And in my mind, I was like, okay, people are going to be thankful and and appalled that Mm -hmm. this guy did this. Right. And like 75% of the responses were that, but then like 25 ish percent were like, you know, I can't believe like jealousy would get in the way of people like working together on animals. And I'm like, <laughs> nope, nope, you that you've missed this entirely, you know? And mm-hmm. and so there have been more than one situation in which when I taught when I've talked with other friends about a certain situation or a, a, an interaction with someone, they'll be like, Well, why don't you like call them out? And I'm like, you call out the behavior, not the person. Like I can't, mm-hmm. you know, you mentioned this thing with negative, negative feedback, negative comments, and it can get, it can really wear at you, but it's like, it's so not worth even engaging with. Like even the engagement mm-hmm. is a loss for you, you know? And uh, it's, 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 it's troublesome because we want to do something about it. If someone was standing right next to us, you know, in a bar and was like this fucking loser, like what a fucking idiot and pointing at you, 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 there would be so many things in you, both cognitive and physiological that would be like, you know, like you just get so fired up and you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. But like the reality is that the, in, the engagement in the first place is much more dangerous then whatever blow to perceived blow to your ego, it would be just to say, 
not doing it, man. I'm just going to go over here on this side of the bar or I'm going to leave and go to yeah. another one. Forget it. This is not worth it at all. At all. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I, I can do it. Like I, I, I've, I've been in situations where that, that were uh, pretty damn dangerous. You know, I, I don't want to get into my whole, you know, the resume of the situations that I've been in, but like, you know, you got to realize like at the end of the day, like, like, what does it matter? You know, if, if you don't like yeah. the content, like why people have just gotten so used to anonymity with, with things like YouTube mm-hmm. and whatnot. And, but that's the, the beauty of podcasting is how you can engage somebody like you and I, that, I mean, we're, we're interacting. There's three of us here. We're talking just, you mm-hmm. know, man to man, whatever. Yeah. But I like that negativity. I, I just, I, I don't see any point in, in, in throwing gasoline on something like that. You're just giving these people what they want. And I feel like a lot of people, like it, 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 it takes work to create something. It takes very little to destroy mm-hmm. something. You can spend years yeah. building a castle and it only takes like, you know, one person to come over and just knock the whole thing over. And I, I don't have respect mm-hmm. for people like that. You know, sometimes people voice opinions and you know what? I, I disagree and I take the time to think about it. And um, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, the dog's going bananas upstairs. Okay. But uh, I'll take some time to think about it. Sometimes, you know, I might actually agree with the person. I might say, hey, you know, this thing, I think it was, I, I don't fully agree with you, but now I, now I, you know, I listen to your side of the story and I get it. Uh, and honestly, you'd be surprised sometimes like that's the best way to like take the, take the wind out of somebody is to say, Oh, wow, you know what? I listened to you. I'll, I'll, I'll give some thought to your perspective. Yeah. And then they're not getting the, yeah, content, totally. the engagement that they wanted. And then they realize that they got nothing. They got nothing to stand on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just so you know, by the way, the, the dog is barely coming through on the mic. So don't, don't sweat it at all. Um, good. But on, I mean, like on this kind of thread of just like maintaining professionalism, I mean, that's one thing that I have that has always stood out to me about your podcast is just um, the kind of the, 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 the consistency and the quality of what you're producing um, just feels at like a very high level. And it's like very clear to me that you, um, that you're taking it seriously, like you said, that you take pride in what you're doing. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to just what your, what does your preparation look like, you know, as you're leading into an episode, um, you know, how do you kind of go about that? Sure. I, I like to go unprepared and I like guests to be prepared. I don't like to just kind of fly off there. I mean, certain situations I'll do like the three of us, like I'll just, I'll just, you know, vibe off you guys. And certain guests, I'll have come on and be like, "Look, I really don't have a script. We're just going to kind of roll with it." But probably about ninety percent mm-hmm. of the episodes, I, I do. I go and I prepare. And there's really two ways two ways about it. Like number one, it'll be well, three ways I should say. Number one is the easiest, which is just like someone I've had on before. I have you know th- three years. Sometimes people you know they, they just they do well. They're great guests. I'll have them back on. Like you know, yeah. my buddy Troy Goldberg. I have, I've had Troy on a few times. I've had Jay Summers from Sandfire. I've had Mike Titula from Alpha Reptile. Just, you know, interesting people I've had on a couple of times. And I'll say, hey, look, um, you know, I want to do an episode about such and such. What are you doing two weeks from now or a month from now? And we'll, we'll set something like that up. The second type is a referral where I might have a guest say, hey, uh, why don't you reach out to this person? And I'll, I'll do that. Hey, you know, so-and-so said, um, maybe you might be interested in doing the show. And uh, I might message someone on Instagram or something like that, or you send someone an email. And then the third is kind of just like the cold call where I'll, mm-hmm. this is mostly what I do with, with, with researchers. I'll kind of, I, I regularly comb through journal articles and any, anything that comes across my feed because, you know, Google, you know, Google knows everything you're doing. So a lot of frog content. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I found, I, I found her, paper that came up recently i reached out to the author of the paper and i interviewed actually interviewed her yesterday i i'm i mean just so you guys know i i did i did record two shows yesterday and i worked for i worked 14 days straight so like if that oh, is oh evidence, man if that doesn't evince dedication i don't know what does but um just uh, to get back on track i'll read a paper i'll try and find who the author is reach out to the author and say hey this is who i am this is what i do i'd be interested in having you on the show you know, if you have any questions, I just mm-hmm. kind of like a formal letter, like you, like a formal introductory yeah. letter. And um, once that happens, then some, you know, some people respond, some they don't. Um, usually, people, I'd say probably like you know, three quarters of people will respond. Um, sometimes stuff mm-hmm. just gets lost because there might be a language barrier. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the authors of papers are outside of the U.S. and 
I don't mm-hmm. know if it just goes to, to junk or whatever, but um, that can be a little bit of a, of a challenge sometimes, but it, it, not always. I mean, I've had people on from, from Australia and the UK and um, so a lot of people from South America, but mm-hmm. I'll, I'll work up an outline. I usually list about maybe 10 to 15 questions just so that the guests and I have an idea of what we're going to do. I usually talk about the person's background and then we'll kind of segue into a few different topics and then maybe wrap up. I like to give people a chance at the end to promote whatever content they make, paper, research, whatever it is, just so that the listeners get a little something extra. And then the guests get the value of being able to talk about whatever it is that they want to talk about and give the listeners something to take home after that. And that's really it. Um, audio prep is not really that sophisticated. I, I use my MacBook. I use GarageBand as the editing software. I have a little interface, um, kind of the way Dylan does it. I, he's got, I think, a Zoom 6. I'm looking at mine now. I think it's a Zoom 4. So I can record. Um, I, I do all my interviews are audio only. So I just do them through the phone. I used to either do WhatsApp or Instagram or sometimes just landlines. goes in through the interface. My mic goes in. It goes into the MacBook straight into GarageBand. That's pretty much it. The software is a little bit of a pain because they don't really give you instructions. And whenever there's an update, you kind of have to relearn it. And I just got to pray that the computer doesn't crash or stuff like that. I don't get a power outage. I, I mm-hmm. recording space. I honestly record in my closet. I'm down in my frog room now, but the closet just got the best acoustics because I got all hardwood floors and I got dogs and kids. So it's kind of hard to find a quiet place. <laughs> so yeah, you know, my wife's cool with it. A, a couple of hours every Thursday night, I go in, I record. I after the interview's over, I edit everything and post post it on the hosting site and it goes live. And it's, I, I tried to make it easier for myself because for a while I was really, really like over the top critical of, of sound quality. And then I realized that certain things I just can't control. And mm-hmm. I, I was freaking out because I had some guests on and their audio was just bad. I, I couldn't really do anything about it. I couldn't clean it up and post. And I was like, Oh shit, like what am I going to do? And they did great anyway. And I realized that, you know what, yeah. if, even if the audio is bad, I mean, as long, it can't be like horrific, but even if it's not that great and people are interested in the guests, they're interested in the topic, they will listen to it. Like I had some guests on, oh, yeah. the audio was awful and the, the stats were just like, they blew other episodes away. So I don't know. That's just, just, just be, be, be prepared for whatever weird stuff comes up along the way. And, you know, that's it really. I, I, you know, I, again, I wish there was more to it, but I try to keep things, try to keep things simple, but consistency, consistency is the most yeah. important. And knowing that your, your guests feel better when they know what they're getting into, especially scientists. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. I think, especially with scientists, it's funny. It's like, sometimes I'll ask guests, you know, it's like, do you want, do you want an outline? Do you want some questions? And a lot of times I find that people actually don't want that because like mm-hmm. it, there's something about like the, the thinking about it ahead of time makes them nervous or anxious, you know, it can amplify that feeling. But I think it makes sense with, with more of like the scientific community that that, that, that would be desired. Um, and yeah, I have a few more questions about like kind of more amphibic cast. Mm-hmm. And then I'd love to sure. pivot more into broader conversation of herbiculture, but I'm curious about um, if you feel like you have like kind of specific goals for amphibic cast at this stage um, and have they have those goals changed, you know, since you, since you started the project? Um, That's a good question. I guess I'd have two answers. Number one is is consistency. I, I feel an obligation to provide people with a quality show. So I like to make sure that I'm, I, I, I create enough content to supply that need, but on the same token, it does take a lot of, it does take a lot of time. And I do have other obligations. And after you know, the, the COVID thing, everybody started podcasts and you know what, they lasted a year and then they, they peer it out. I like to succeed where other people have failed. That's one thing that I, mm-hmm. I really like to do is I, I can get a little over the top and I can get a little extreme with things, but I, I don't like to let go. But at the same token, mm-hmm. I do have to I do have to set reasonable goals for myself as a human being because again, I don't have the the it's not the same world as it was three years ago. So I have to be able to make time for other things. Of, of course, you know, family is important, my career is important, the animals take up time, they're important, you know, there's vet visits and stuff like that. But at the same mm-hmm. time, you do get burned out after a while. And what I've done is I've actually taken kind of a more relaxed approach where if I don't release an episode for a week or two weeks, I don't panic because people mm-hmm. are going to listen anyway. And there's, there's 
you know, over 150 episodes out there. So there's plenty for people to listen to. I just don't want to disappoint anybody. But at the same token, I, I have to take care of myself. I mean, there's other stuff that I, I do need to do and that I want to do. So I don't want to come to the point where it just becomes an obligation. I want it to still be fun. And I've really just kind of gone hard into it this month. I mean, like October, I'm completely booked. And I started booking into November. But I think come like around Christmas time, I had to take a little break. And I think yeah. that that's reasonable considering the amount of stuff that I've put out there. So I, I want to keep at yeah. it. But I want to understand that to, to maintain the longevity, I'm going to have to be able to pace myself accordingly. So what do you, what yeah. about you guys? How do you, how do you guys feel about putting out content? Like how do you pace yourselves? <laughs> oh man. I mean, what well, I, I definitely, I definitely feel like, you know, a, like a, like a personal kind of commitment to trying to get something out weekly, you know, and that's, that's just not always possible. You know, Phil and I are both super busy people, you know, we both have pretty, pretty, hectic lives. Um, and oftentimes they're hectic in different ways and at different times. And, um, you know, my schedule is very irregular and all that stuff. So it can be challenging. And like, you know, this, just this last, you know, two weeks, we, we haven't dropped an episode, but we actually have the episodes, but they just haven't been edited because our, my editors, um, on vacation, part of the time he was actually here visiting. And I was kind of like, Oh man, like, you know, but it's, it's fine. You know, I know that like, like you say, um, you know, the people are going to listen, you know, and, and I know that we have like very, um, understanding and like loyal, you know, following, you know, for project herpetoculture. culture. And so there's that, but I definitely feel an obligation to, to be consistent. And, um, I also feel an obligation to be consistently improving. You know, I, I want to be, I want us to have better audio quality. You know, I've got, I've got a more, more decent microphone now. There's a more decent microphone headed toward Phil here soon. I think that that just like gradual upgrades like that, I'd love to to do. And, um, you know, I think that the most important thing for me is to feel like um, we're building community um, through the podcast. And um I don't know. I think in some ways that kind of sounds a little bit like kind of trite or like silly in a way. Cause it's like, it's a podcast, but at the same time, um, you know, the, we, I feel like we've made a lot of really good connections through the show and have like, you know, connections have deepened through the show. I mean, even just Phil Phil's in my con- connection, you know, um, has really grown through, through hosting the show together. And I'd love to get to a stage where we can do things more, um, face to face, we can show up at a few expos every year and actually talk to people and, um, yeah, just continue to kind of, uh, contribute to this community and this, this discipline, this trade that we feel so passionate about and indebted to. Yeah. And I, I agree with everything that Roy just said. I also feel like there's something about, um, I think Roy and I both, feel a bit of a uh like a responsibility not to force anything you know and so and so like i don't ever want to get to the point where i'm recording a, a podcast because i have to you know yeah like, i want to record a podcast because i want to have the conversation with that person i want it to be real natural um like it's not nonsense like the, like mm-hmm. when Roy and I started talking to each other about doing this, we were talking about how, like, these are the conversations that we'd be having anyway, you know, that mm-hmm. we, that we would call people and have conversations like, don't you think Euromastics Thomas I are weird, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, and yeah, it's like, I do think they're weird. What do you think? Why do you think they're weird? Do you think it's, do you think there's like weird genes? And it's like, yeah, there's weird genes, you know, like, or whatever. I, it, I know that's nonsense. Um, no, it's, it's not. I have the, we have the same conversations with frog people too. We'll talk yeah. about how certain mm-hmm. locale is just, just weird or how a certain frog is yeah. just really like derpy. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Yes. And Tom, that's exactly what Thomas I are, by, uh, by the way, is derp. They're so stupid in some ways, but like, it's, you know, like I had an entire conversation with a friend of mine about hybridization and like why 
it's not a big deal. And people bug out about something that's not, not number one, not a big deal and not something that you can control after you die. Like, good luck. <laughs> you know, and I mean, again, I understand there's a whole different conversation to have about hybridization and I'm not doing it. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily trying to talk about that. It's just an example. And it's like, these, these are the conversations that we're going to have anyway. Like why, why not record them? Why not talk about, this is the same thing as when you go to a show and you get done with the show and everybody's at the bar or the waffle house and they're all shooting the shit about, you know, I went to Arizona. I found this one weird locality of Arizona mountain Kings and it was like really weird. And they were all like this. And I don't know why it was, but there's highways mm-hmm. all around them and they all like seem kind of isolated. That's fun stuff to talk about. And so, you know, also there's, there's like this, uh, an ongoing theme for me personally has been, um, like a, like a, a concerted probing and investigation into the kinds of things that we take for granted because, and it wasn't because it's not like I thought about this. It wasn't like, Oh, I, you know, turns out I did a lot of thinking about the, some of the terminology we use in herbiculture and turns out it's like actually kind of baseless. That's not where it's coming from at all. It's coming from the experience of my own life and realizing every year that passes by a greater set of things that I've taken for granted, a greater set of things that like, I never investigated this concept. I never put in the time, you know, I mean, you know, you mentioned Rogan's podcast earlier. Like you, I can list a set of 10 shows that I listen to. And the whole reason I listen to them is because you know what, like 15 years ago, I might've just written off this person as nuts but they're not like, it's not, it's not nuts. It's like, this is another person who's out there in the world operating with good intentions. And I, you know, it'd probably be okay for me to like pay attention and at least hear them out. You know, it's okay to disagree with people. It's fine. It's not a big deal at all. Everything does not have to be in, in this day and age. Yeah. Everything does not have to be a catastrophe. Everything does not have to be a, a, a brutal fight to the death. It doesn't have to be that. Mm-hmm. It's okay to hear somebody's somebody's point of view and disagree with it, but you know, be mm-hmm. within reason. I mean, be be civil. I mean, certain yeah, stuff yeah. gets a little out there, but yeah. you know, within within reason, because then at least you can say, "All right, I've given you the benefit of the doubt." But um, yeah, yeah it, it's it's you. You want to have some sense of purpose, but at the same time, you you want to hear, you almost want to hear other people's. Like a lot of times, honestly, like I'll listen to certain podcasts and like especially kind of like the paranormal stuff. And like there's two yeah. types. The types that are like really good and legit, and you can tell it's it's bona fide. This person's giving an account of something that whether it's true or not, this person believes it's true. There's emotion. There's there's a story. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes people like my guilty pleasures. I'll listen to some that are just terrible. And <laughs> in my real life, I'm critical of this because I know this person's lying. I know this, I know this person's completely full of shit, but it's still entertaining. So uh-huh. you know, you, sometimes people ride both sides of the coin. You know, you're not going to, you, you can't be one thing your whole life. And when it comes mm-hmm. to content, you know, that's another thing you have to do too. Is like if I, if I put out the same show every week and I didn't vary the content, it would get boring. So I have mm-hmm. filmmakers come on. I have biologists come on i have hobbyists come on i had a, a scientist who breeds springtails in a lab come on whoa and, and that episode i love that was, episode that episode was yeah. huge yeah, people went crazy over it and i was like this is it was such a trip <laughs> thank you thank you but I, I i realized the fact that like you know like you guys just said is that you, you have to draw from many different wells and mm-hmm. that's just part of you know that's just part of keeping an open mind and part of making what you know i i hope is, is a good product and something that people enjoy and some people take something away from. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. It's so, it's so important for people to hear different perspectives. And I think that that's, that can be the value too of like some of these podcasts where people, you know, like are following the podcast, you know, and if that, if that podcaster, that podcaster is, is seeking, you know, is seeking to provide, wide variety of perspectives there's a lot of value in that because i think that just generally we have like an empathy problem in the world you know we could we could use a little bit more empathy out there in the world and one of the ways to cultivate it you know is just to 
just to hear other people's experiences and try to try to empathize with them, you know, and that's, again, like you don't have to agree with everything. And I certainly don't agree with everything on a lot of these podcasts, but um, I still think it's a useful exercise to, to hear different perspectives regardless. Yeah. Roy, I think you're doing it wrong. I agree with everything I hear ever on any podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously. Uh, That's why you're being controlled, Phil. Dude, I'm such a corporate shill. Like, I've just... Been- <laughs> you know, uh, another thing that just came to mind that I, I, I didn't mention before is, like, the um, when it comes to prep, doing, mm-hmm. like, vocal, vocal prep. Oh. Because, like... I, my pod, my pod, I mean, even my kids, like, that doesn't sound good. Like, the, the my speaking voice on the podcast is kind of different from the way I talk normally in, in day-to-day life. You know, I don't, I, I don't curse on the show. I, I try to dial my accent back a little bit because that can get a little bit out there when I'm getting passionate about stuff. So um, <laughs> I feel like, controlling you know being able to have some sort of self-control when you when you're doing this kind mm-hmm. of type of content works as well because i don't want to inject too much of too much of myself into a conversation mm-hmm. where it really wouldn't be appropriate like I, I don't like someone a good a good friend a great listener mentioned something to me early on i gave him a lot of credit for this he said you gotta slow down and actually let people talk and that was a big takeaway mm-hmm. for me was you, you know being yourself but at the same time not overwhelming guests by kind of monopolizing the conversation. So that was another thing that I learned early on, which I think benefited very, very well. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's, I have a, I think there's, a, uh, I enjoy the learning that comes from talking about all this, you know, like I'm not just getting better at being a conversationalist. I'm, you know, like that's, that's a huge part of it, but I'm getting, you know, it's, it makes me a more thoughtful agent in, in my conversations. Mm-hmm. You know? Cause when I'm on, when I'm on this, I don't, I'm not interested in like having anybody on the show where the whole point of the show is to argue with them. And I'm like a naturally argumentative person, like go figure. And you know, anybody, <laughs> anybody who spends a lot of time around me is going to know that already. Like I, I love the act of argumentation. And part of that is because that's how I, that's kind of how I probe the world. That's kind of how, that's like the way in which I've figured out to like find, find out things about the way the world is. And um, obviously it doesn't necessarily win you a lot of friends, which I totally understand, you know, but uh, you know, we could have people on the show with whom I profoundly disagree. You know, (laughs) it's like, I just don't, you know, like maybe I just don't agree with them at all. Like, you know, where I, I, it may even be people with whom I've had like maybe not so savory interactions with previously. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, this is, that's not the point of the show. It forces me in a compartmentalized way to set that aside and say, I'm just going to have a conversation with this person because there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong inherently with what they're saying. And that's okay. Like I, and practicing giving them space to like, let that out even around a person Mm -hmm. who might have disagreed with them. It's like, it's been really educational. And then top that off with the fact that I've been really, really lucky to like learn an an insane amount from the, from the production of this show. You know, obviously we're not, we're like, we got a guy who edits for us and that's all great. But like just doing this and having the conversations is like, whoa, it's like, man, like every single show I feel like I come away a totally different human being with a different perspective on what what I'm doing and why I do it. And there is no way I could have, there's no way that I could, uh, I like, I just, I just, like, I just don't, I don't feel like my experience of herpetoculture would be as rich without Mm -hmm. the, 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 the show itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, completely. It, it it translates into being a better person. You know, if you, if you can, it, because it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of effort to be a professional, and some people can, some people can figure it out, and some people can't. Like you know, like like losing your, your shit in public is 
you can't do that. And so, I mean, we all do it. It happens mm-hmm. sometimes. But, you know, when you're when you're making an effort to actively engage someone who you know you're going to disagree with and still be civil about it, you can translate that back into real life. And the next time, you know, you're, you're out in your everyday life and you have an interaction with someone that, that's not positive, you can take a lot of that behavior from the show and then kind of translate it into other situations because it's all – you know, every, every community has its its troublemakers, and every community every community has you know bullshit. Like I'm a huge angler, you know, Northeast United States, you know, New York, Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. You know, saltwater angling is huge, and just as much crazy drama and crap goes on with with mm-hmm. you know fishing community, and yeah. you know the same. I mean, same thing like with you know reptile community. It's deep, it's fish and wildlife. And with us, it's, you know, it's, it's DEC. And not that this animosity, but it's just people like, oh, you know, you hear about the new DEC rule. And then we got, now we've got to use circle hooks and we got to do this and that. And people get up in arms about stuff. But, you know, again, you can't, it's, you can't, you have to be civil. You have to maintain some sort of, of yeah. integrity. I feel like the discipline that goes into doing this, it helps you do that in everyday life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, tangent, yeah well said. Tangent. I had to throw that in. Yeah, no, no I, I can, love it. Couldn't agree with you more. So um, I guess like, I know, I think Roy framed what we were saying earlier very, very well, which is like, we'd like to kind of, you know, now that we've talked a lot about the the show, sort of what that's about. And I actually do have, I, I have one more question about the show and just sort of that maybe, and it might be a little bit vague, but like, is there anything that stand that like, that like jumps out to you that you've learned through doing the show, like anything in particular, like, you know, I don't, I know that there's probably a lot, I'm probably sure there's a lot of things, mm-hmm. but, but is there anything in particular that's been like, man, I never really thought like, this is just, this is this weird thing I've gleaned from four years of, and 150 plus episodes of doing this. Yeah. Um, one thing comes to mind almost immediately. And that is the Ufaga genus. Mm. Ufaga is a, is a genus of, poison frogs in the dendrobatid clade and they are very very unique as opposed to other other frogs phyla you know phyla phyla babies tink, um dendrobates you know tictorics all these other yeah. species have nothing on them because of their behavior and their life cycle the big takeaway for me and it's going to sound completely ridiculous is these frogs have more in common with birds than they do with other frogs based on what? their behavior their parental care their calling uh, um I, the guest I had on uh, earlier, she's doing research with bioacoustics, and she found that the male and female, well, this is Nufaga, but ran, ran its maya imitator, the males and females communicate to the point that it's very, very sophisticated, and they have parental care. They, they, um, the female will lay unfertilized eggs that the tadpoles feed off of, and the male will basically notify her when she needs to do it again. It's it's amazing the high level of derived behavior and sophisticated life cycles and natural history. That's my key takeaway, and that's I always wondered why people had such a fascination with Ufaga, and it's just because they're on a completely different level. You could put them in a box with parrots, and they will have more in common than they will with other dark frogs. That that was my amazing big eureka takeaway from the past few years. That's wild. That's really cool. I never would have considered that. Yeah, it seems totally out there, but that's great. You know, it's funny. Speaking of birds, we we um we have an upcoming show. Well, we <laughs> man, I don't want to speak too soon. We don't have like the show set or anything. We um we have my employee at my shop, Brendan. He he has a teacher down in Colorado Springs who studies birds, and she uh Brendan kind of gave her wind of some of my discussion of hybridization and, and, and like how it happens in the wild all the time in various ways, shapes and forms. And she was like, she, she reached out to Brendan and say, actually, you know, it's kind of weird with birds. They're kind of a unique study in that point because they can fly. They can just go anywhere they want and go do things. And and she was talking about how there's like, they've jumped families. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's hybridization events that have occurred where they've, or integration events where they've occurred where they've jumped families and it's like, oh, we got to have this lady on the show and talk to her. You know, I don't know anything mm-hmm. about birds. I know nothing about birds at all, which is I, is actually something I feel like a great shame over. But, <laughs> but uh, 
uh, it's, I don't know, this kind of reminded me of that. So, so maybe we should, um, we should switch gears and start talking like about her- herpetoculture broadly. Roy, do you want to, you want to, would it be okay with you to kind of spearhead that? Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, I mean, I think that, I mean, this is kind of a low hanging fruit question in some ways, but I think it's a good thing to start with. And, um, I mean, obviously you, you do host a show called Amphibicast. Um, your primary focus is amphibians. I know you also keep reptiles. Um, and so I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to like, how did, how do these disciplines differ, you know, and, and what is, what is distinct about keeping amphibians, you know, from, from keeping reptiles in your mind? I try to approach keeping from, I, I guess my default perspective is someone who keeps, keeps frogs because mm-hmm. uh, you keeping dar frogs in and of itself isn't that difficult. If you get everything dialed in, it really, it, it isn't. We, we kind of like to make it seem like it's more complicated than it is, but um, I mean, certain species are more sensitive. Certain species of Ufaga and the Ranatomea species are kind of tiny, so they can be a little, little, little bit more fragile, but that's arguable. But um, mm-hmm. th- there are certain disciplines that you have to have. I mean, these things need to eat regularly. You need to make fruit fly cultures on a rotation since you always have a supply of feeders. I have to make sure that my house isn't too hot. It isn't too cool. Uh, I mean, you can't, go, you can't go on vacation for two weeks and expect these things to be waiting for you when they go home. I mean, like mm-hmm. my, my snakes, I have, um, I have the three now. I have two blood pythons and my California king that I've had for almost 23 years now they can, I can give them water. And then if I have to go away for a while, they can do what they do. They're not going to necessarily require any, any you know, day-to-day maintenance. Whereas the frogs, you, you can't just get up and go away for a month. You can't do that mm-hmm. because you're going to have to make sure that, that the misting system has enough water in the reservoir and that they have adequate ventilation. They have adequate food. You have to monitor your fruit fly cultures. If they crash, you're going to have enough to have another source for that. And, um, the frogs can be, they can be very fragile. If you, if you do a form, I feel like certain species of reptiles are just more forgiving and that may be why there are more of a presence in the hobby. Like, uh, for example, you know, corn, corn, corn snakes, ball pythons and whatnot. I feel like they're tolerant of a lot more variability than the frogs. You know, if it gets, if it gets over 85 here, you, their behavior changes. You can see that they're uncomfortable and it can be fatal for them. Yeah. If, if my central air goes, I got to get that back on or I'm not going to have my frogs. So, yeah, that is, I mean, again, that can happen with any animal, obviously excessive heat, but excessive heat into the mid 80s isn't necessarily a catast- a catastrophe for, you know, with the exception of a few most common reptiles in the trade mm-hmm. can kind of handle that. That's within the realm of, of acceptance. Yeah. The frogs, they can't they can't handle it. So it takes a lot of dedication. And this is, this is a one man operation. I do all this myself. Um, there, there was a time where I, I actually, um, I, I did end up in the hospital for like two weeks. My wife, and my kids, they figured it out and they took care of it. But um, there, there's a lot of nuances. Whereas like, you know, you have a, like a, like a dog or a cat or a ferret or a rabbit or whatever, someone can come in and kind of clean up its poop and feed it. And that's the end of it. There's more nuances to this. So you have to be, ready for that kind of, of commitment to be able to have these things, or at least, you know, have a buddy system where, you know, someone can step in to take care of them for you if you do mm-hmm. decide to go away. But I, I'm a big homebody. I don't really go anywhere. So it's just sort of jives with my lifestyle. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Very nice. Very, very nice. So um, I'm curious, like if you, if there were like major, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I hesitate to ask this particular question sometimes because I don't want it to sound like I'm asking you to sort of like bash the industry or like do anything quite mm-hmm. along those lines. But if, if you had like, are there, are, I guess, so maybe I can make it a two-sided question. So are there ways, are there, are there critiques that you might present about herpetoculture broadly? And then um, maybe we can balance that out and say, if there are things you would like to see that you'd like to say, maybe I'd like to see this change or a little more innovation around this particular side of things. And you could even subdivide that and say, well, amphi- amphibian keepers really have this down, but reptile keepers kind of suck, you know? And then like, maybe, <laughs> and then maybe. I, 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 no, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I, I, 
I think that you need to tailor your approach based on what your target species is. And, you know, the, keeping the frogs can be stressful, but only if you make it stressful. And of course, me being me, I make it stressful. So then I got into tarantulas. <laughs> tarantulas, I actually got into them because they basically do nothing all day. And it was kind of a Zen moment for me to just sit and stare at them, just, you know, sticking out of their little hides. But, um, you know, I, I see criticism from one it's funny because like the, the exotics hobby tends to encompass reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates. And, you know, the, the dart frog world, we kind of watched with the drama that happens in the reptile world. And we kind of just roll the window up and keep driving. But um, I, I don't, what I'm most critical of is people will understand the what, but they don't understand the why and where it came from. And with the, changes that have happened in people's ideas of what's right and wrong. I'm concerned that people don't understand the theory behind why certain things are the way they are. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that with this. Mm -hmm. The reason you set up dark frog tanks the way you do is for two reasons. The first is practicality, which might surprise people. Practicality. And number two is, of course, aesthetics. Um, the practicality and the aesthetics go hand in hand because of the beauty that the, the, the planted enclosures in part, I see a lot of people appropriate the dark frog method of keeping with other species, and they somehow automatically assume that because it's in the dark frog tank, that it's the best method of keeping another animal. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I have a I have a problem with that because I feel like a lot of people think that just because I, I mean I, I you guys can kind of see some of my well the lights went off, but um, mm -hmm. you know my tanks are planted there. I take a lot of pride in them. I know people who have a much better command of, of the artistic aspects to it. Um, I mean, some people that come off the bat, you know, of course, you know, Troy, Troy Goldberg, um, Sh Sharif, um, um, Joseph East Coast Frogs. I'm gonna try, I, I could rattle off a whole bunch of people. Um, Tigil over in, in Europe. I mean, some of these people have incredibly stunning tanks, They're beautiful, well-planted. And, um, you know, mine are not that sophisticated, but I guess to the average person who's not, not used to this, I guess it would be pretty impressive. But the, the basic things that we have in there, like, you know, drainage layer, substrate, and the backdrop and plants. Well, that's practical because it, it just goes with their, their life cycle. And the drainage mm -hmm. layer, for example, is one of those things that I see people employ or think that they need to employ when they don't. The drainage layer serves the purpose of being a drainage layer. So when you have species that live in an area that have very high rainfall and have high humidity, high humidity and soak substrate do not go hand in hand. And soak substrate is not good for dark frogs. And it, it's it's something you want to avoid. So when you mist, when you you know soak that substrate, it has to go somewhere. It has to be carried away. And that's what the drainage layer is for, as well as the plants. It keeps the roots from getting bogged down. In nature, in the biome that these things live in in the forest floor among the leaf litter you get heavy rains it washes out and then it's dry again so you don't want them sitting in these like swampy soupy conditions but on the same right. token why do you need a drainage layer if you're not introducing heavy levels of high levels of humidity and, and misting so with mm -hmm. my my blood pythons for example what purpose does it serve to have a drainage layer in their enclosure or, or even plants nothing in that tank is going to handle the, the the mess that they produce in these like i mean i don't know if you guys mm -hmm. have worked with any of the blood or short cut pythons but when they go it's like you, you got to take the day off from work to clean it up <laughs> I, yeah. don't, I don't i don't believe in adding that mode where it's, it's inappropriate you know this helps the plants the plants eat up a lot of the waste they there's a lot of microfauna in there that the frogs eat it kind of it's it's self cleans as best as it can and yeah you can appropriate that for similar species there's plenty of species that will live in a similar environment uh, maybe with some tweaks, maybe with some more ventilation and whatnot. But when I see people build a dark frog vivarium and put a species that's not appropriate for that in there, I, I kind of scratch mm -hmm. my head and, and people are like, well, this is, you know, this is a bioactive tank and it's going to solve all my problems. It's like, well, what have you actually done? You, you've created kind of a half-assed dark frog tank under the assumption that this automatically confers better husbandry. And in some cases, yeah. it will. to be fair, it will. But in some cases, it's not necessarily consistent with what the animal will encounter in the wild. So I, I see people do things that aren't necessarily appropriate for the animal that they're keeping. But 
they were kind of led to believe that it is. So, um, I mean, you're at the opposite end of the spectrum because you keep very arid species. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know the first thing about your mastics other than I've seen a few of them and they're pretty cool looking. They kind of look like they kind of look like like a derpy looking like turtle head thing to me. But they're, they're <laughs> cool. Um, I, I was never really into arid species. I just I I I like the the lush greenery that goes along with this, but. Yeah. Um, I, I see people do stuff and then they get very, very critical of other people for not following that moat. Like I'm, I'm on, I'm on a forum. I, I don't want to say really what it's about, but um, there's a few keepers. It's not, it's not, a, it's not, it has nothing to do with frogs. It's an invert forum. And um, there's a few other frog people there and I, and there's a few people who, who do make these types of tanks and the inners will come on and they'll start posting questions about, um, you know, bioactive and do I need a drainage layer? And then, will say, no, you don't need a drainage layer because you're not, I mean, number one, if you're talking about a fossorial animal, what purpose do you have putting a drainage mm -hmm. layer in there when it's going to want to burrow down to that bottom anyway? So you're already creating an, something that's inhibitory of the animal's behavior. Mm -hmm. And number two, it just doesn't go with certain species. You have an arid species of tarantula. What are you putting a drainage layer in there for? What, what, why are you doing that? It, it, it serves no practical purpose. That drainage layer does not automatically confer a higher level of husbandry if it's not appropriate for that species. So that's one of those things that kind of like miffs me. And then, like you mentioned earlier, people will get kind of hostile and they'll, you know, well, what is this? And I'll, all right, well, you know what? Fuck you. I'll post a picture yeah. of one of my tanks and I'll say, hey, just so you think I'm not nuts, this is what I use for my frogs. And that usually shuts people up pretty quick because they realize that mm -hmm. uh, you are comparing apples and oranges. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I find that, Frog husbandry is frog husbandry, and snake husbandry is snake husbandry, and monitor husbandry is monitor husbandry. Like, for example, I think that monitors need a lot more mental stimulation than oh, sure. my frogs do. So I feel like rather than adding a drainage layer to a monitor tank, give it something to do. And you watch some of these animals mm -hmm. try to solve problems, like my king snake. He'll solve problems. I have to give him things to do. I mean, I'm not giving him a Rubik's cube, but I'll, have to, yeah. I'll give him a paper bag. I'll give him toilet paper tubes. I'll get something for, something for him to do, or I'll hide a prey item in a, in a toilet paper tube, just something for him to problem solve. The yeah. frogs don't do that. And I, if you want to, if you want to see a, like a frog embarrass itself, try to watch it solve a simple problem because there's not, <laughs> a, lot of, there's not a lot of complex, com, you know, stuff going on there. But I mean, again, mm -hmm. I want to provide good husbandry for an animal. You got to figure out what that animal's need is and, and cater to that need. So having a, you know, having an animal on, like, for example, like having snakes on paper towels, it's not the end of the world. I mean, I would provide something more than just a paper towel, but, you know, I give my animals, I give them paper bags from the grocery store mm -hmm. and they love it. I'll give them a car, like an Amazon box with a hole cut and they'll go in there. And then, you know, you, then you throw it out, you put something new in there. So like a, a, a static environment does not necessarily, you know, just check all the boxes off. And I'm sure you guys going mm -hmm. into, you know, the, the, the broader reptile community, I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard stories about stuff like that too. And, and like, yeah, if for some reason, this is more of a dark frog. I and mean, for some reason, people have this crazy idea that dark frogs live in paludariums, and they don't. They're, they, they're not made to live in that type of tank. Yet every time you go somewhere, it's this elaborate paludarium with these huge water features, and they don't, they don't like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, go figure. Again, and that's, that's, just, that's just a myth in the frog world that got perpetuated. People automatically think that you have a planted tank, it has to have a water feature in it. And I'll tell you, with the exception of my, my mossy frogs, which are in a pallet area, they are semi-aquatic. The dark frogs, I got rid of all the water for features years ago. It's a rookie mistake. Yeah. So I hope that, I hope that answers the question, you know. But no, I, I no, definitely. Critical, I try to help people. I try to offer people advice that's constructive. So I feel like when you shoot somebody down, it's really not the best way to encourage somebody to learn. But, you know, again, at the same time, though, some people, some people just get a little too big for their britches and you kind of, you, you have to stand up for yourself every so often. But I try not to get overly critical of people. I just try to offer advice in a way that I think is, is constructive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the way to go. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, you know, 
I guess mm-hmm. that lead, I feel like that kind of leads me to a lot of questions. You know, there, there's a lot there. Um, there are ways in which I'm surprised when, um, I think I'm always surprised when people take the higher road, like, or feel like they're taking the high road when they, when they keep a particular way, you know, I feel like this, this is like a a recurring beef for me in particular, you know, anytime uh, people, you know, (laughs) uh, not to try to take the wind out of my own sails here, but sometimes my own railing against like naturalistic keeping kind of comes from the fact that so many people who keep naturalistically, elevate it above everything else in, in their behavior and in their, in their tonality, they say like, well, this is obviously mm. the right way of doing things. And so, you know, um, and maybe that's a little bit unfair of me, but, but, um, you know, I, I really love what you said there about trying to be more helpful to, to, to individuals, you know, I mean, I feel like, I feel like this is something we should all be tasked to pay attention to and do. We, we want more people keeping reptiles. We want, and amphibians, we want more people paying attention to this area of the world. So that way there's fewer people who can try to legislate us out of existence. Right. I, 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 I agree. I agree. I, I don't like elitism. I, I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong that there, there is, you know, I, I do believe that some gatekeeping is essential and that goes with, with every type of culture because you, you have to come in and you have to pay your dues and you have to understand that things are done a certain way for a reason. And yes, those reasons will evolve and those reasons will change. I mean, by and large, dark frog tanks have remained pretty much the same since the 1960s in, in Europe. Uh, I could, I'd could, i have to look, but I could show you pictures of vivarium magazines from the 60s and 70s from continental Europe. And they look pretty much the same way that they did today. So stuff is advanced, but it's the premise is the same. But mm-hmm. there's elitists at both ends of the spectrum. And, and I feel like there's this, this need to shame people mm-hmm. for keeping things differently. And I don't like that. I, I think that that's cowardly. I think that calling people out and shaming people online is a, a, a baseless and cowardly way to try and change somebody's mind because there's a wall between two people. I mean, if I'm, I mean, mm-hmm. if I'm in a room with you guys or we're on the phone and we're looking at each other face to face, we can have a legitimate discussion about what's happening in, in a civil manner. Whereas online, you know, it, it's just, I don't like that. I don't see that as being a positive thing and not for nothing, but how yeah. do you punish somebody who's just, just ignorant. I don't mean ignorant with a negative connotation. I mean, just doesn't know. You you can't yeah. you can't be angry at a five year old for not knowing the Pythagorean theorem because the kid hasn't learned it yet. So there has to yeah. be some positive transition. And I feel like a lot of people get this idea that they're they're you know they're the elite and they, they you know they they have the highest standard of care because they have the most expensive enclosure. And they have the most stuff. And a lot of it oftentimes is just buzzwords. A lot of the frog people mm-hmm. I know don't use expensive lights. I, I do just because I happen to like this particular brand. But a lot of them just mm-hmm. use regular LED, regular fluorescent lights off of Amazon. Um, we're not yeah. using, you know, $100 lights. A lot of times, a lot of people make the tanks themselves. They're they're not, mm-hmm. you know, you, you know you're not buying a starter kit. And I feel like a lot of people who, a lot of people who create content do this too. And I have theories about why that is. Mm. Um, oftentimes, we'll be critical of people who don't keep animals the way that they do. And I feel like certain people act like an ambassador, meaning if you don't do things my way, which is kind of the trendy, accepted way. And trendy can be right, believe me. It, it can be mm. trendy can be the right way. But I, I don't feel like. Like mercilessly criticizing people because they keep animals differently than you serves any practical purpose whatsoever. I feel like it shoots people down. And some people by, by all means do need to be corrected because they do things. And the, you know, you, people will come on, they'll ask a question and they'll get the answer and they don't like the answer. And they say, I'm going to do it anyway. I, I can't help that person. And that person yeah, probably yeah. should be discouraged, but you know, not to the point of, of, of embarrassing someone. Like I've had, I've had people send me pictures and, and, bounce ideas off my head and, and I'll, you know, I don't go public with it. Uh, I'll just politely say to them, I, I don't think that this is a good idea. And these are my reasons why, because they're asking questions because they're curious and they want to know. And I've had some people say, yeah, oh, of course, I'm going to do this anyway. And I say, all right, well, look, you can do what you want. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not the fraud police. You can do what you want, but yeah. um, I recommend. I don't know. I kind of like, yeah, I kind of like the idea that you're the frog police. Yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah. 
Look, you know what? There's no experts. We're all students. We're yeah. all students. And the moment you think you know everything is the moment that you know nothing. The older I've gotten, the mm-hmm. more I've done this, the more I realize like, I don't know a damn thing. Yeah. I pick yeah. up on I pick up on what I what's going on around me and I try to learn. I try to figure things out. I try to problem solve and I try to base my approach even sometimes on people that I don't agree with. People that I think I have nothing mm-hmm. to do with. Let me hear it out because maybe there's some shred yeah. of something in there that I can use. So yeah, I, I just I don't like that criticism. I don't like that hostility. I think that it fosters a lot of animosity. It it, it cuts people down who may have a good uh, you know a, a good leg up, who might do very very well in a year, two years, or three years. So I, I don't care for that. I, I don't like elitism. I don't like people who you know oh you know, I keep everything bioactive and I, I look at the tanks and it's like. You're keeping pothos and cocoa fiber. You you haven't created anything natural. You've created the the garden mm. center at Home Depot. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's it's it, it is more aligned with what the animal would get in the in the in the wild. But again, wild is that's a a, a more in depth mm-hmm. conversation. But you know, having a, again, f- frogs just function very well with the plants. They do. You really cannot have a dark frog tank without live plants. It's it's. Mm-hmm. functionally impossible it just makes it a nightmare mm-hmm. but you know at the same token like i have plants from you know home depot <laughs> i have home depot plants now i have yeah. a pot now that i've had for 30 years i took a clipping yeah. of pothos 30 years ago and i've just taken cuttings of it and it's in a lot of my tanks but you know what it's analogous yeah. to something similar that they would encounter in Suriname, Guyana, or Brazil. I mean, yeah, the plant isn't the same plant, but it's kind of shaped the same way. It kind of accomplishes the same purpose. Then you get into more ornamental mm-hmm. stuff. But plants are just really good at maintaining community. They're really good at breaking down waste. And they also, the coolest thing about it is they, they grow and the, and the enclosure changes. So like my blood right. pipe is basically going to look the same. This will change. I'll have, I'll have, I have mushrooms blooming in a lot of them now. I don't know what it is, but mm-hmm. this has been crazy with mushrooms. And then they'll disappear in 24 hours. But that that creates the, you know, the, the I guess you want to call it the enrichment or whatever it is that the animals yeah, need. Yeah, absolutely. This three-dimensional thing. But the other animals that I don't do with that, I accomplish that in different ways. And it's just, it's, you know, uh, again, like I tell people, like, you know, I keep my frogs this way, but I keep my snakes that way just because it's, it's, mm. it's good for one. It's not necessarily good for the other. Yeah, I think it's so important to emphasize that that what we're often what we're trying to do is is replicate functions and processes more than necessarily like a certain aesthetic or image. You know, this is something that Phil and I talk about a lot. You know, it's like naturalistic herpetoculture. I think like you can you can have a vivarium that functions. In, in you know, in providing a ton of natural processes and opportunities for natural behaviors to emerge that aesthetically doesn't look natural, you know, and I think that that is like it's important for people to understand more the function of things and the process of things than it is necessarily like you know replicate like this image. You know, it's like how many times have you seen like the exact same bearded dragon enclosure? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, a million times. Yeah. But, um, there's a lot of that. novel ways that you can do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I don't, I don't say that just, just to slander it or anything, but just to say that, like, I think it makes for a much richer experience for all involved, including the keeper, when you understand the process and and why you're, you know, providing these for these functions in the animals. Absolutely. And um, yeah, yeah. No, you. I mean, you said it best right there. And I mean. I get it. It's also a balance. Like you don't mess with success, right? If something is working mm-hmm. relatively well for a large number of people, for a large number of animals, I get it. There's a reluctance to go and, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. I kind of, I really get that, you know, but I, I also think, um, you know, novelty is good for everybody. It's not just, not just us. Novelty is good for everything. So why not? Why not try to take it a little bit of a, you know, a step further? And, I mean, as long as you're not doing harm, yeah, I don't see it as an issue. And again, I'm not, people are welcome to keep animals, you know, however they choose. And I think that there's, yeah, obviously there's, we have a responsibility because when you think about it, there's absolutely nothing natural about what we do. 
Nothing right. naturally lives in a glass box. Nothing naturally lives in you know any which way you want to cut it. We we are responsible with them because they're not you know in mm-hmm. they don't nothing lives in a glass box out in the wild. Nothing lives on cocoa fiber. You know nothing lives on cocoa mm-hmm. chips. You know nothing lives over a layer of leak. But so we are. We're responsible mm-hmm. for them. We're, we're responsible to provide them with appropriate care and to give them a good quality of life and to make sure that they're you know. They're, that they do well and that they're given every opportunity to act as close to what they do. But um, I, I feel like it, you can accomplish that in, in, in different ways. And, uh, you know, like I said before about the monitors, you know, hi, having a big enclosure is great. You know, hide prey items around someone that you don't necessarily get caught up in, in, in plants, especially if the animal's going to wreck them. I mean, like my blood python, she, I mean, she, she's a bulldozer, but I mean, her, you know, her enclosure, again, it's not, it's not nothing remarkable. She's got her hides. She's got her light. Um, I, I actually, I actually stick a, a little Tupperware container of hardwood charcoal in there. Cause it actually, it does really well with odor control. Plus it's just something for her to poke around in and I'll, you know, I'll throw stuff in there, but uh, blood tail pythons are very, very common in palm oil plantations in Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And what's natural about a palm yeah. oil plantation. In fact, honestly, this is supposedly horrible for, for, you know, for the, for the, yeah. and they do exceptionally well there. It's a man-made environment. Um, I mean, there's plants, there's substrate, there's palm fronds, there's places with some that hide and there's rats. It, it's, yep. it, it, it is in a sense, a, a not natural environment that human beings have created. It's just a much larger scale. And the snakes purportedly do very, very well there. And they're very, very common. And they're also welcome there because they do a lot of rodent control. So you know, like I, I, I caught the episode that Phil that you did with with Dylan a few weeks back, and we were talking about the naturalistic fallacy, and it got me thinking. And that was the first example I thought of was that snakes in certain conditions actually benefit from a human presence because it provides them with prey, provides them with hides, and they're going to want to live a comfortable, stress free life. And if you're providing your animal with a life that's comfortable and as stress free as possible, uh, I think that that should be the end goal. And you can meet that in di- you can meet that in different ways. You know, buying a kid at the store doesn't act automatically confer success. It's understanding that specific animal and what that animal's needs are. And I think I already right. said, but just to, just, just to completely beat No, the it's <laughs> yeah. Redundancy emphasizes importance is one of my, uh, one of my mentors used to say. That's true. Damn. No, that's true. Well, and, and, you know, I feel like a, a recurring theme in my own personal discussions has been like, what, what is and isn't natural? Like, like, it, like wh- where are the, where are the boundaries for what constitutes natural and unnatural and mm-hmm. who gets to draw those boundaries? Why are they drawing them? You know, I mean, the idea that nature is not a steady state. Things change mm-hmm. all the time in a given environment, habitat, you know, uh, to say that, you know, something, you know, like you mentioned the palm oil plantation. Yeah, totally like weird and disrupted and altered from, from the status of the last, you know, X number of millennia, totally novel, Mm -hmm. but you know, and not, but, and also most life is highly adaptable to, to, to even relatively um favorable conditions you know mm-hmm. and, and, it, and it doesn't mean that there aren't costs to the way things are when you change them you know i mean I, i'm not i'm not in any way advocate advocating for palm oil plantations or or, or anything quite like that I, i'm just saying uh like what you know what you yeah. know like we met, you know, Roy and I have talked about this and I mentioned it on that show with Dylan, like which, which natural state are you referring to? Which one? Mm-hmm. Because depending on what animal you're talking about, there's lots of different natural states. I mean, and there's ways that, that what we might can otherwise consider the natural state have changed way before our own understanding. So like another one that I, I love to, to go back to is the, um, it's some stat about how something around 70 something percent of the flora and fauna of the San Francisco Bay is completely invasive and non native. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I have something else to say about that in a second, but it's like 
Why did that happen? Because of the ballasts of ships. I mean, you want to talk, you want to talk about like an accidental spreading and mixing of, 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 of biodiversity. Like it, no one, how, what's unnatural about that? That's not, not natural. That's, that is, that is, you know, like it, like I'm not interested in a, a dichotomy in a, in a dichotomy that places human beings as separate from or in opposition to the natural world. Now, it doesn't mean there's not effect. Of course, obviously it'd be foolish to argue anything different, but like natural is a weird word, invasive and and not native. Like, okay, at what point is something native or endemic? And why do you get to decide it? Why is it at that point and not another? You know, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. This is, I mean, maybe we're getting a little, maybe I'm, I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but I, it's, it's just something that I feel strongly passionate about right now because. I'll, 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 I'll offer some input. Mm. Mm. People, people live with a tremendous sense of guilt, especially people who've, you know, live within the past 50 years, I, I think, because during the past 50 years, the, the narrative that, the earth is in, in jeopardy has, has perpetuated for quite some time and justifiably. So I feel like people as human beings, we, we feel a tremendous amount of guilt and we project our feelings onto other living things. Mm-hmm. And I feel like trying to understand the world, the way another living thing perceives it. I don't think that that's within the realm of possibility. If there things are analogous and we know scientifically it's been proven that certain animals will behave Similarly, like others, like I mentioned earlier, the analogy between the faga and, and birds, they, they call, they exhibit parental care. It, it's very, very sophisticated. And they, they communicate. They're even, they're, and rats may imitate are actually monogamous, believe it or not. So that's, you know, they have a pairing. It's amazing. But we can't imagine understanding how they completely perceive the universe. And, you know, just to, to bring up the, the fisheries thing again, because, you know, angling is, is my other passion in life. You know, I... I I love being outside on the water and it's, it puts me in a natural place. I like that a lot, but fish have a lateral mm-hmm. line. So mm-hmm. that's an, that's a sense that we don't have. How can we possibly perceive the way they perceive the world in the absence of a sense that's so significant? Mm-hmm. So people don't understand how to make sense of things and they feel guilty. And then they react in a way that maybe is trying to overcorrect, overcorrect something that might be beyond the point of what we can what we can correct. You know, like the the analogy you mentioned before about the you know the the, the invasive species. I mean, like here in the Northeast, we've got spotted lanternflies. They're invasive and they're causing a lot of problems. And people are encouraged to kill them on sight. But a lot of people don't want to do that because they think that they're beautiful and they have some sort of a purpose. You know, what's right, what's wrong. When you think about it objectively, you know, it, it does seem kind of capricious because does the life of a lantern fly have more value than the life of another insect? Or, it, you know, it's we create all these categories for ourselves and we try to somehow make sure everything is right. And you realize that the more you try to hold everything at once, you just you, you can't. And everything kind of just starts to slip through your fingers. So it's a convoluted mess. Yeah. We're never going to make sense out of it. But I think that what we need to do is kind of look at things from, you know, where we are now and we're not where we thought we were going to be because we've made, we've made tremendous progress in, in preserving the natural world. And that's a function of, of a lot of things, things that I agree with and things that I don't agree with. It both had positive impacts, but um, you know, when you talk about divorcing ourselves from the natural world, I honestly do think a lot of people have completely removed themselves from the natural world. And I feel like their only experiences with nature are through social media, through YouTube, through television, and through, you know, things that don't physically put them in those positions. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, dude, I, I have seen thresher sharks up close. I've seen seals. I've seen all sorts. I've seen you know, weird stuff that I don't even know what it was. You know, I, I, I mm-hmm. walked next to a stargazer. The other stargazer is a weird fish, which is actually pretty venomous. But had I not been out there, I never would have seen it. And I never would have appreciated 
appreciated it. You know, things aren't going to be in these in these perfect boxes, these perfect categories. I ran into a box turtle that worked the other day, and it was not this majestic, pristine Wikipedia photograph of a box turtle. <laughs> it was just this regular box turtle. You know, looked a little bit, a little bit aged, and he just took off before I could even see it. But you know what? That's my interaction, and I feel like people mm-hmm. have these ideals about what nature is supposed to be and what this is supposed to look like and how this is supposed to behave. And nature isn't like that. You know, like you said, nature it, it fluxes, it's it, it ebbs, it flows, it changes, and I don't think that we can fully control it the way that we want to, even if our intentions are for the better. And I think maybe that's something that we need to consider as we move forward and we address our relationships with other living things. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's well said. I feel, I feel like, you know, a lot of a lot of the work that I'm doing, you know, aside from herpetoculture in that world, is is kind of in ecological literacy and land stewardship and um you know just the other day i was i was leading like a a guided hike for like this company retreat at this this land base that i helped write a management plan for and it's like the 670 acre property and you know we we talk about one of the things i talk about with the, with these guided hikes is like writing the process of writing this plan you know it's like this 200 page document and and it's also fully like an it's a, it's an adaptive management plan because the reality is you know all all that it is is a bunch of suggestions for okay this is what we would suggest to do if you're trying to achieve this objective but the reality is that once you take this action you need to reorient because we don't exactly know how that how that action like what are all the, we can't anticipate all of the things that that action could set in motion mm-hmm. and um, I think that that's just something that feels like a consistently important thing to for for us to understand about the natural world is is just, and is to be both humbled by it and and awed by it. And I think that in some ways, that is a merit that I see in herpetoculture because again, you're you're um, you're interacting with other living creatures, and like you say, it's like it's complicated, (laughs) you know, and, and especially for people who aren't having those interactions with, you know, wild spaces and quote unquote natural world. Um, I think that that's incredibly valuable, you know, to, to again, have those interactions on some level, even if it is within a, you know, a dark frog vivarium in your living room. Yeah. People who are people who are critical of keeping these things. I, what I would say to them is this, is that, you know, there are some people, you know, life is, is the bell curve. There are some people that do things, some people who do things exceptionally well, some people who do things terribly, and then there's kind of a middle ground. And, mm-hmm. you know, by and large, that still gives you, you know, 80, 90% of people who are doing the right thing or as, as best as they can. Yeah. But yeah. I, I defend the hobby, but with, with, with this logic is number one, um, you know, I do a podcast that does focus a tremendous amount of effort on new scientific research and conservation, because I think that that's important. Mm-hmm. I think that if I'm going yeah. to advocate to keep these things in captivity, we need to understand their value in the wild and how different they are in the wild, as opposed to the way that we keep them in captivity. That's an important thing. Number two, it's very commonly accepted in the dark frog world that in situ efforts to preserve habitat are a priority. And I interview a lot of people who do in situ breeding programs, you know, frog farming, which is sustainable things Mm -hmm. that give back to local communities, because that's another thing to to consider is it's very easier for us to sit in an ivory tower here. And then there are people that live in a different part of the world who have their own struggles. They have their own priorities, their own needs, their own desires. And this is a part of their world. So we have to be respectful of that and cognizant of that. So involving people, I mean, All the conservation efforts that I've had the pleasure of of talking to uh, all have the same goal, and that's to preserve these things naturally. And some of their most ardent defenders have been people in the the dark frog world. We have American Frog Day annually. Um, It it did not happen this year, but in previous years, we've had representatives from EVAC. We've had um, representatives from um, 
entities in, in Panama, Colombia, um, quite a few organizations whose goals are to protect wild, wild dark frog habitat because it, it is a very, very unstable area with regards to uh, land usage, you know, and, and some things happen there that are, you know, you could have a locale of frogs that just be gone, you know, and it'll be, you know, pasture or gold mine or whatever. So that's a logistic threat. So I think that people who are involved in this world who have an affinity for a particular species or a particular group of species can be that animal's greatest champion. By keeping that, cap that animal well in captivity and being a good ambassador and a good steward of it, uh, it can be a very positive thing by exposing people who are not otherwise familiar with it. I, my, my, yeah, my youngest daughter is, is in middle school now, but I used to do a talk at her elementary school every year. They had a a couple of weeks in the winter time where they'd have parents come in from the community and they would talk about something that they liked. They had a, a, a police officer came in, a, a, a mom came in talking about um, yoga or something. They had all the all their people came in and I thought to myself, this is a really good opportunity and I get to come in. And the reason that this kid gets to see these animals is because I keep them and I keep them well. Mm -hmm. And I provide good representatives of these animals along with the natural history of how they live, where they're from, and why we should care because that's the most important thing is we should care so if we mm -hmm. keep these animals in our homes in our businesses in our collections um it's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful hobby it's something that we all are very passionate about and some people make a living off of it and i think that that's great that they make a living off of it but we still have to value them for what they are which are you know, other living things that live a life that is very very different in many ways than our own so I, I feel like people who criticize things are often in a position to criticize because they know nothing about it. And that's the thing that frightens yeah. me the most is people who have no knowledge of a, of a given situation and criticize. But Phil, I'll be honest with you. I don't know a fucking thing about any kind of uromastics at all. I don't so, know anything about dark frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> but... I, I keep reptiles and I keep amphibians, but that doesn't automatically confer authority on me to be critical of the way that you keep and raise your mastics. That's your passion. That's your area of, of, of specialty. So who am I to criticize? But Dan, he, he keeps them in kiddie pools, man. I mean, come on. <laughs> they get little swimmies. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's... I, I don't know about certain things. So I don't like to offer advice. I don't like to offer criticism unless I know. Mm -hmm. it. I feel like it's very easy for people to, you know, dogpile and say that there's only one method for everything. There's not. There's thousands of species that we're keeping. Many of them are similar. Many of them are different. So, you know, what can we take away from this? Well, you know, just advocate and, and try and educate everybody around you that you can, that this is a good thing, that this is a positive thing. This is an ambassador program that you can inspire young people. You can educate people who were otherwise ignorant and just bring a part of the natural world into our everyday life that we can appreciate. Oh, hell yeah. Oh my God. That was so well said. I'm, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, so, okay. So I just want to say we are r right over two hours and, and I, yeah, I figured yeah. it was, it was getting a little long. No, it's okay. I yeah. just, I, I mean, I'm not, I just wanted to make sure I'm being respectful of everybody's time. That's it. I'm no, that's not. fine. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I got no other plans tonight. Okay. Okay. And, well, okay, cool. So, so, you know, I spend a lot of time talking with people about this because in my, you know, my, my, one of my other, my other career is to be a jujitsu coach and I run a jujitsu academy and so it, it inevitably comes up. People always ask me, they always say like, what's, what's up with the lizards, you know? And I'm always just like, let me tell you, you know, <laughs> like it, it's, yeah. it brings me great joy to, to be that representative and, 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 you know, sort of be a diplomat rather for, for, for herpeticulture and say like, look, dude, there's so many different reasons why this is necessary. I mean, whether it's the fact that there are some of these animals which have no functioning conservation efforts in their country of origin, whether it's the fact that some of them represent areas of the world in which they're prioritizing human development over, over wildlife preservation, whether it's the fact that it's a means of educating, um, educating people on how to 
improve the baseline standard of care for these animals that are going to be present in the trade, whether I want them to be here or not, whether it's the fact that there is an ethnocentric perspective on this, which says that we're using, and that's not even the right way to put it. These animals are filling a gap in us that we have left over from when we interacted with wildlife on a more daily basis. Um, whether it's the fact that in an ever-changing world, there's no guarantee that these things are going to be here going forward without radical and swift adaptation. I mean, you name it, there's a million different reasons why this is a good thing to do. And when I get to talk to people about it and they say, oh, I never thought about it that way. And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. you know, like that makes me feel extremely fulfilled you know, because I remember growing up and having people look at what I do is like, why do you do that? Like, why, why are you, why do you, what's, uh, why do you like lizards, weirdo? You know? And I'm like, mm-hmm. why do you like anime, weirdo? Like, just leave me alone. And I love anime, you know? It's just like, it's, <laughs> uh, the way it's evolved, um, the way that so many more, uh, let's say next generation herpetoculturists are redefining the why and the how behind what we do. I mean, it's, it, it's incredible. I mean, it's absolutely remarkable, you know? And, and I mean, to be just to be privy to all of that um, and around it is like a, yeah, it's nuts. I mean, it's a weird, it's weird. It's like, it's a weird place to be. It's weird that this is the world we live in right now, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, it is because you're, you're dealing with other living things. Like if you're into, if you're into football, like I'm, I, I'll be honest, with you, I, I don't, I was never related to football. I don't know much about it. And I asked a guy I worked with years ago. I said, just, I said, explain this to me. So why do you like this? He said, well, he goes, I like the strategy. I like the planning. I like the execution of the plans. I said, you know what? I said, I get that. I said, it's not mm-hmm. really my thing, but I, the fact that you explain it to me like that shows me that you really care about it. And even though it's not my thing, I respect the fact that you care about it in that way. You know, the same yeah. thing with, 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 with anything. Like I, I try not to be, I try not to be critical of people who have a legit interest in, in something. You know, even if it's something that I don't really agree with or think is you know that interesting. I, I find that people who think and people who have hobbies and people who have interests, people who have passions, people who, who are eclectic, you, you, I, I want to know what you have to say. And again, that also kind of goes back to the podcast mm-hmm. interviewing people. But um, I think that it's, it's, it's important to have interests and understand why people have those interests. And I'll, just, I'll tell you guys one other thing. I've, in 152 episodes, out of those, I've probably interviewed probably probably 100 to 120 different people. Mm-hmm. Some people have had them multiple times. Let's just say 100, 100 to 120 people. Not one person has ever told me that they were critical of the amphibian hobby. Not one. Mm-hmm. And I've had people from all different walks of life. Um, one or two people just, they really, they weren't amphibian people. They were researchers with within like chemistry or something like that. And they, the fact that they just worked with frogs professionally was kind of incidental, but they still, you know, had no problem with it. Every single person started out catching frogs, toads, salamanders, and lizards. Mm-hmm. And every person, every hobbyist, every researcher, every scientist, every author, every vet, every vet's assistant, all of them. So every one of those people in all those different walks of life had the same experience as a kid being out in the wild. You know, catching animals, looking at them for a little while, you know, letting them go. And that was the impetus for them to become the people that they are today. And many of them, all, all of them, all of them are very remarkable people in their own life. And that, and that was a catalyst to that. So, you know, while we're, while we're, you know, talking about interests in people, you know, again, without this, that wouldn't have fostered all those people, you know? Yeah, all people who put in all that conservation work, people who are physically in those environments, in those parts of the world, doing this for basically nothing. You know, I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not living high on the hog doing this type of work, and they're right. doing it for many of the same reasons that we are. You know, so some of them have different opinions. Not everybody is is in, in favor of certain things, but 
you know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's all, it's all a means to an end. Yeah. Man. Oh my God. I, I like, I, this has been such a great conversation. My brain is so fried. Some deep shit. Right? <laughs> like in a good way, you know, like in a really, really good yeah. way. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, yeah. I am struck at once by my desire for the conversation to continue and also to talk to the Oh no! Like, is that okay? Is that okay to say? I don't mean to be. I like. No, I, it's fine. I think. I think it makes sense to probably move toward toward our closing question. But I also yeah. feel like simultaneously, like I'm. I feel with you, and just like this has been really rich. And yeah. Um. I mean, Dan, it's like it's it's kind of amazing because I think we got through like I don't know two thirds of the questions or something that we had prepared for you. And um, I mean, kind of that that really that I think that really like speaks to just your um your thoughtfulness and your knowledge on this subject and um yeah I, I I'm 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 blown away and and um I feel like I'd love to have you on again at some point in the future if you'd be willing to oh, yeah. come I, back yeah, and I, talk to us knuckleheads. I know I know that I know time is I know time's a factor and to be honest I, I usually wrap my episodes up around an hour and a half um just for mm-hmm. my own time constraints but um, like I said, I, I, I've been going, you know, 14 days straight with work and I recorded two episodes yesterday. I, rec- I was editing for like three hours before I got in. So I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm real amped up and ready to go after this. It's going to be over for a while. But, um, <laughs> I, I, what I like about you guys is your number one, your, your professionalism and you guys are willing to listen and you guys are willing to offer input into ideas that you think are are you know are, are valid and interesting you know it, it's it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys and yeah I, I hope i didn't completely derail everything the ad lined up but no no no, no you know sometimes it's, it's it's nice you know I, I i interview a lot of people and sometimes it's nice to be able to speak on my own behalf because i try not to insert too much of myself into the show i don't know why i'm moving this microphone closer because it's not even on <laughs> but yeah no i i get it i i have a tremendous amount of respect for the two you guys you guys are very passionate about what you do um, you put out a good podcast and, and it shows, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, not to offend anybody, but like, I, I probably would have blown you off if I wasn't interested. So. <laughs> no, man. Well, I mean, it, I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. that you're willing. Cause yeah, these are the exact kind of conversations that, you know, when we set out to have this podcast, this is exactly the kind of thing that I was hoping that would, would happen. And so, um, and, and like, yeah, the no derailment whatsoever. This is like what it's all about. You know, if the, the, you know, if every guest was willing to just kind of, you know, expand on their thoughts the way you've done here, it would be, it'd be good. It'd be a good thing for, yeah. for herpetoculture and for, for project herpetoculture. So I appreciate yeah, thank it. You. I, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, I do. Thank you. And we, and we yeah. genuinely, it's a reciprocal, it's a completely, completely reciprocated sense of respect and admiration for what you're doing, man. I mean, it's, it's like, no, we, for sure. We are really fortunate to have anybody's time at all. And we're really lucky that we happen to be in a place where we can get individuals like yourself to come and talk with us and like have these kinds of conversations. And we're really hopeful that. I mean, we're going to ride this as long as we can. You know, it's not as if like we've only been doing it a year. It's not as if we're going to, you know, it's not as if we're we're nearing the end or something like that. But it it no, you know, just 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 for the sake of <laughs> putting it out there, like we really want to see how far this can go, and we have you know so many people that we want to speak to, and so every one of these is is a um an incredible learning experience. So, uh, you know, thank, thank you for, for the time and for everything you're up to. Thank you a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a new me- podcasting is a new media and it's kind of, it's becoming more and more popular. Yeah. You, you yeah. got to separate the men from the boys, you know, women from the girls, whatever. <laughs> you got to, who's, whoever's going to be serious about it and whoever's not going to be serious about it. And you guys are serious about it and it shows, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of people come out, they think a podcast is going to be easy and it's not, it's a labor of love. And you yeah, guys know no, sure. just as well as I do that, it, it takes a lot of discipline to do this. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of planning, a lot of patience. And for, you know, relatively like, you know, relatively low reward. I don't mean, re- 
I don't mean to take <laughs> no, let me take that back. It's rewarding because you get to you get to interact with amazing people, you get to inspire people, and you get to you know share your your love of all the subject matter with people. But I mean, yeah. no one's look. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not making money off of any of this, you know, uh, no. I, I figured it out once. if I did this full time, I'd make 14 cents an hour. So, um, you know, I, I, I do, it, I do it with my, my patrons, which I'm very thankful for. I do appreciate my patrons. That does help. But, um, you know, like you're not, you're not driving around a Maserati if you're podcasting, unless you're like, I don't even know if Rogan drives a Maserati, but, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a labor of love and the way you guys do it. It, it definitely shows. Oh man. Well, thank Thanks you for that, man really super awesome to hear thank you so much yeah um, well so we got we got one final question for you and i feel like in, in some ways we've answered it all already but i, I you know I'd, I'd be remiss if i didn't ask it because it's become such we've only yeah. not asked like one person it was only philippe de Vagile that we did not ask the question to because he if like the whole show was was the question do you know how pissed yeah. off i got at you guys when you got philippe i was like <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how did these guys get Philippe? I've been, I was like, I know a guy who knows Philippe. I'm going to, I'll get him on the show. One point. I heard him. I was, like, sure. I was like, that's like finding unicorn. They got Philippe. Um, I was so jealous. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, hear you. I felt so honored when, when he agreed to come on the show. Cause I mean, we both, you know, Phil and I both know Philippe a little bit, but not super, super well. And we both have obviously great respect for him. But when he said yes, I was like, Oh no, the shit's real. <laughs> it was like we, yeah. we better not mess this one up. Well, and, what's, <laughs> and what's really funny about that is like, uh, it, it, when we have him on again, because I'm I'm sure we will. Um, hope so. I, I, yeah, hopefully, right. Uh, I I feel like in some ways the, que- the the conversation we had, the questions we asked, don't even fit the bill anymore. It's like looking back, it's like. Mm-hmm. And we really, we really shit the bed on that one. We could have asked way better questions. <laughs> that way, do you know what I'm saying? It's like, there's- no, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. That happens to me too. You get to the end, and you're like, I didn't want to ask this, but no, the yeah. interview with Philippe was great. And Philippe, Philippe is like, I, I have some of Philippe's books from the '80s, and oh, yeah. I, yeah. He, I mean, I don't know if you guys, uh, Bob Melu just passed away yeah, yeah. from Parkinson's, yeah. and um, and he and Philippe yeah. worked on quite a few projects and. It's just uh, these these guys. They really deserve a lot of credit. And then Philip and Bob, so the other guys, just oh, yeah. you know, any, like younger yeah. people who listen who aren't familiar with who they are, find out who these guys are because they did the amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's all true. They definitely so true. Like, yeah, true in ways that's hard to describe. Um, uh, so, so the the question that we ask everybody is um, why herpeticulture. And of course that can be as broad or as specific as you like, but I'm curious sort of what your reaction to that question is. I think about what motivates different people and we're all motivated by different things, whether that's a function of what we, what we're born to be, what we're raised to be or any combination thereof. This has just always felt right to me. It's always been something that's been Mm. comfortable to me. I've never had any negative memories or bad experiences associated with this. Whereas other things in my life, I've had bad experiences and, and negative stuff that surrounded it. This has always been positive for me, and I always want to keep it to be positive. I like to watch things grow. I like to watch things thrive. I like watching the plants grow. I like watching the frogs call or well, listening to the frogs call. I, I like to make things live. I don't like to th- see things die from neglect. It, it honestly drives me crazy. Maybe that's just the compulsive personality traits I have. I have a hard time letting things go, but I, I like to see things live, thrive, and grow. And this is just a good catalyst for that. And it gives me something to do. It's um, you, know, you think about like certain hobby. When you think about what, what what is a hobby? A hobby is basically just a way to spend the time that you're not stressed out and miserable. And mm. it's just it's, it's it's a good hobby for me. I I, t- I take a lot of you know, it's stressful. It does, but it's a good stress. I'd rather be stressed out about my, you know, my frogs not having enough fruit flies than, um, you know, my, my mortgage or something like that. I mean, thankfully I don't really have to worry about that either now, but, um, you know, it's, I guess the, the only way I could phrase it, I think about like, 
the best way to find peace in the world is to do a pointless activity. I don't mean point because it's not pointless. Everything that we've done is is pointless. But like, do I need these things to to live to survive? No, I don't. Part part of me does. Part of me does need this to be fulfilled as a human being and alleviate stress. And it's but it's just like anything else, you know. I, I, I go out fishing all the time. It's it's a pointless activity. You 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 play chess or you watch football or you know you, you do something. It's it's not essential for your, for your survival. It's not putting food in your mouth. It's not putting a roof over your head. It's not giving you water. It's not doing any of that. It's just a diversion. And it's a good diversion. It's just I find peace in it. I enjoy it. I like problem solving. I like figuring new things out. I like talking to other people about it. It just satisfies that need in me. Whether it was something else, destined to be something else, I don't know. But this is what it is. And you know, I, I don't see any any plan to not do this anymore at some point, you know, I mean, obviously I don't want to have these many animals if I make it to 80, but I can't imagine myself not having either a frog or a spider or a snake or something like that around. It just seems Mm -hmm. strange, strange to me, you know? And it's funny because I, you guys mentioned earlier about, um, I think Phil, you mentioned about when you have friends or whatnot come over. I don't know if you guys have kids or not, but um, it's funny because I, I have to explain to my daughters that not everybody lives like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going on. So yeah. it's, I say, look, you know, um, don't mention this to everybody because it might, not everybody might be comfortable with it, you know, and most yeah. people don't have a problem with it, but um, you know, not everybody has 30 frogs in the basement. So um just the lucky ones. It's 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 a lifestyle. Everyone's got a quirk. Everyone's got a certain thing that they're into. You know, some. I mean, I, it's I, it's socially acceptable to be like crazy for like you know Disney and, and the Giants, but you know, <laughs> being surrounded by a bunch of frogs that are uh, diurnal frogs that are calling in the dark is just is weird. But yeah, I don't know. It, it makes me happy. It makes me happy. Brings me joy. It gives me something productive to do with my time. And I, I, that's what I take away from it. You know, it's like having a garden, only instead of uh, growing mm. tomatoes, it's, it's frogs. And they don't yeah, taste beautiful. good. Beautiful. It's good like tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> but they look even better. Yeah, they look like nice <laughs> frogs. Yeah, one of them, my, my terabilis, mint terabilis, such a beautiful frog. It looks like oh, a, big yeah. green, a big fat green golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome, man. Yeah. I love that answer. I just then, and I resonate with a lot of it. I love that. Just like the best way to be happy is to just do a pointless thing. <laughs> you know, don't spend your like, time being miserable. You know, uh, I, I tried oh, it, man. Yeah, I tried it, and we have to live. Me. Yeah, yeah, we have to live, man. We gotta, we gotta figure out the things that make it worthwhile and make it bearable. Because there's a lot, there's a lot out there that that's that's hard enough about just being alive. So people, people say. You know, uh, I'm not afraid to die for what I believe in. Mm-hmm. Fuck that. Live for what you believe in. <laughs> Live yeah. for what you believe in. Get up every day, look in the mirror and say, I'm happy with what I'm doing. And if you're not happy, change it. This makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Like I said earlier, you know, times in my life that were difficult. And everybody goes through that. Everybody goes through hard times. And this, this changed things for me. So, yeah. Yeah, don't waste, don't waste your time being miserable and pissed off. Find something that you like, do it well, do it every day, and make it your most important thing. That's it. Damn. Well, Life drop. Boom. There you go, day. everybody. You heard it from Dan. <laughs> Andy the man. And um, yeah, Dan, I mean, where can people find you? I mean, obvi- it's obvious, Amphibicast, anywhere else they can follow you. You can follow me on Instagram. Uh, it would be at Amphibicast. And um, the, the best way for people to follow me and interact with me would be on Instagram. That's the only platform I'm on. I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. I, I, I have a YouTube channel, but I, I post absolutely nothing on that. I, I kind of just started it just to support uh, some of my YouTuber friends. But um, yeah, listen to the podcast. It's available on every, pretty much everything. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, um, like pod streamer like i was pretty much wherever you are you know i'm actually i'm on imb i am what is it imb now you know oh, yeah, imdb yeah yeah, 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 like, yeah. Why the hell am i on here and then every episode <laughs> um well, so but yeah it's, it's um 
you know, uh, it's, it's, it's available anywhere. You can find podcasts. If you want to follow me, Instagram would be the place to go. And, um, you know, if any, if you take away something from this, um, I, I hope that it's positive. And I want to thank the two of you for letting me come on the show and give me the opportunity to talk about this stuff. And if you are listening and you're, and you're new and you want to find out more about dart frogs, uh, by all means, listen to the podcast. Um, if, if not, there's plenty of resources that I can give people in addition to that. So if anybody wants to reach out, you know, send me a message on Instagram. I try to get to everybody's messages. If I don't respond right away, um, don't panic. I'll, I'll get to you as soon as I can. And thanks. I appreciate the time. I got I got to have you guys on my show again. I, I don't, We got to frame something, but I'll, I'll have you guys on. Anytime. Yeah, I'd love that. Anytime. Yeah, we man. can maybe continue yeah. this from, uh, you know, Maybe we could reverse things. I could ask you guys about, um, you know, why you guys like why you know why would you choose to keep this derpy looking lizard that looks like it belongs in it? <laughs> it, it looks like it looks like something a kid would draw in kindergarten. Yeah, it does. Yes, I do look that <laughs> they way. They totally That's do. One hundred percent true. In person, they look even more like that. So it's, it's yeah, true. No, I, I will. I will always be happy to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you also. Dan. Love it. Roy, you want yeah, to Yeah, such that? a pleasure, man. All right. All right, I'm going to hit the button. button Until right. next time. <laughs>